starring Jack Benny with Barry Livingston, Phil Harris, Rochester, Dennis Day, and yours truly, Don Wilson. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, as there are only eight more programs left in the current Lucky Strike series, at this time, I would like to pay tribute to a man who, for the past 30 weeks, has brought joy and happiness into millions of American homes. Uh, don't forget the 569,000 trailers. <laughs> a man whose wit, charm, and personality have endeared him to the hearts of his public. Keep going, Dow. We have a half hour. <laughs> a man who is loved, admired, and respected by every member of his cast. How true. <laughs> a man who every year at this time picks up our options, Jack Benny. Thank you, thank you. Hello again, this is Jack Benny talking, and Don, since you brought the matter up, I suppose you received the contract I mailed you for next season. Yes, I did, Jack, and I'm not quite satisfied with some of the clauses. Huh? After serving you faithfully for 14 years, I'm surprised that you had the effrontery to present me with a contract that was not only insulting, but relegates me to a position that no self-respecting man would accept. Well... <laughs> <laughs> and just what is your complaint, Mr. Wilson? Well, here's the situation, Jack. Now, you get a lot of laughs at the expense of my being fat. Uh-huh. And this year, my weekly salary has been at the rate of $2 a pound. Uh-huh. So I think it's only fair that next year I get $3 a pound. Three bucks a pound. <laughs> Don, I wouldn't give you $3 a pound if all your fat was trimmed off and you were hanging on a hook. <laughs> Anyway, the raise I offered you is as high as I can go. Now, what do you say? I can't sign the contract now, Jack. I'll have to talk it over with the little woman. Oh, you and the little woman. Haven't you got a mind of your own? Yes, but I respect my wife's opinion. I I'm very devoted to her. I see. After all, I'm at home with her every day except Sunday. Well, I can fix that, too. <laughs> Now, look, Don, I've been very fair about this whole thing, and I... Oh, hello, Mary. Hello, Jack. What are you talking about? Oh, Don isn't satisfied with his new contract for next season. He isn't? No. Oh, my goodness. And after all you've done for him. Well, that's the way it goes, Mary. There isn't much gratitude in this business. Why, Don Wilson, you ought to be... Never mind, Mary. Thanks, just the same. By the way, have you read your new contract? Yeah, what are you trying to do, bring back slavery? <laughs> So I'm going to have trouble with you, too. Uh, what's wrong with your contract? I don't like Clause 7. Clause 7? Oh, Mary, I mean, it, it only happens once or twice a year. I don't care. If you buy a turkey, kill it yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Mary, can I help it if I'm sentimental? You're not sentimental. When you pay for a whole turkey, you hate to chop anything off. <laughs> oh, no, stop. Sentimental. You even use the head for badminton. <laughs> I stopped doing that. I mean, I couldn't stand the way it came over the net staring at me. <laughs> anyway, Mary, you've got a lot of nerve complaining about your contract. After all... Hiya, Jackson. Hiya, Don. Hello, Livy. <laughs> Hello, Phil. Phil, it's about time you got here. What made you so late? It ain't my fault, Jackson. I had plenty of time to get here, but just as I left the house, Alice fainted. Oh, my goodness. That must have scared you to death. Nah, it happens every time I kiss her goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> oh, brother. That's what she said as she hit the floor. Phil, Phil, do you really have that effect on Alice? Jackson, she won't even let me shave with a mirror. She don't want my love divided. <laughs> Well, if I paid you by the pound, your head would ruin me, you know. <laughs> now, look, just pick up your baton and let's have a band. Hold it a minute. No, you don't, Jackson. I ain't making with no downbeat till I talk to you about that new contract you sent me. My lawyers don't like it. Your lawyers? Who are they? Kerchie, Bagby, Fletcher, and Fink. <laughs> oh. Well, Phil, just what is it you and your lawyers object to in the contract? We don't like the clause that says I got to get to bed on Saturday night before 3 a.m. 
Well, it's for your own good, Phil. After all, you have a program to do on Sunday. I want you to look bright and fresh. I know, but if I lose that red glow in my eyes, I ain't got no personality. (laughs) Phil... Phil, I've been playing badminton with a turkey head for two years, and it looks better than you do. (laughs) Anyway, I'll talk to your lawyers about your contract later. But right now, let's have a band number. Okay, Jackson. What would you like to hear? Henry Bussey, but I'm stuck with you. (laughs) Now, go ahead. Play anything. Hold a minute, Phil. Come in. Well, look who's here. Pardon the intrusion, Mr. Benny. Hello, Mr. Kitzer. <laughs> well, Mr. Kitzel, it's certainly nice to see you. I'm sorry to bother you, but I wonder if you could spare a ticket to your next week's broadcast for my uncle who's visiting me from the east. Oh, you have an uncle visiting you, eh? Uh-huh. Uh, what part of the... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> What, uh, what part of the East is he from? Pomona. Oh. Well, anyway, Mr. Kitzel, I'll be very glad to give your uncle a ticket. You have wonderful boy. You know, for this, he'll give you a box of oranges. He owns an orange grove. An orange grove? Oh, of course. Pomona is in the citrus belt. Belt, suspenders. During the drought, he lost his pants. Oh, well, that's too bad, huh? Thank you. Anyway, Mr. Benny, I hope my wife will have better luck. Your wife? Yeah, she's opening a restaurant on Oliveira Street called Mama Kitzel's Adobe Hacienda. <laughs> <laughs> but, Mr. Kitzel, that's Spanish. Uh, can your wife cook Spanish food? Ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> she specializes in tamales with sour cream, uh-huh. enchiladas with chopped liver, uh-huh. chili con corned beef, and Spanish smorgasbord. <laughs> <laughs> Spanish smorgasbord, what's that? A herring that's taking a siesta on top of a slice of onion. <laughs> well, that sounds novel, huh? And the tortillas, you'll be crazy about it. The tortillas? Yeah, that's a crepe suzette that shouldn't happen to a dog. <laughs> uh, well, Mr. Kitchen, let me know when you open your restaurant. I'll come down and visit you. Buenos dias, senor. Goodbye. What did I say? I don't know. I think... <laughs> Kitzel's Adobe Hacienda. That's... And now, ladies and gentlemen, for our... Uh... Say, Jack, where's Dennis? Dennis, I don't know, but I hope he gets here pretty soon. I want to talk to him about his new contract for next year. A new contract for Dennis? Yeah. I thought you had him sign up till next Haley's Comet. <laughs> well, it's the same contract, Mary, but I added a new clause. Hey, Lev, you should have seen the clause Jackson tried to get into my contract. Never mind. What was it, Phil? If I ever find a dime, before I can spend it, I gotta call Jackson and find out if he lost one. <laughs> Well, I did that for a gag. Where's your sense of humor? I mean, just because I... Hey, maybe that's Dennis. I'll get it. Hello? Hello, Mr. Benny. This is Rochester. Hello, Rochester. What do you want? I've been listening to the program, boss, and it occurred to me we haven't discussed my contract yet. Well, Rochester, you've been working in my house for 10 years, and I feel there's no necessity for a written contract. Uh Uh-huh. Everything is perfectly clear. We have what is known as a verbal agreement. Uh-huh. Now, that means we have a mutual understanding. Why put things on paper? The amount of money involved is too small. That's what I mean. Let's get it up. <laughs> You'll be taken care of. And believe me, Rochester, there's no necessity for a written contract. But my attorneys advised it. Whereas and to wit. Your attorneys, who are they? Remus, Bemis, Sugarfoot, and Smythe. <laughs> Oh, well, tell Remus, Bema, Sugarfoot, and Smythe to get in touch with Kirchie, Bagby, Fletcher, and Fink. <laughs> Let them handle it. It's the same firm. They got a branch on Central Avenue. <laughs> oh. Well, anyway, Rochester, you've got nothing to worry about. I'm giving you a substantial raise next year. Substantial? Yeah, you know what the word means, don't you? I ain't illiterate. I'm skeptical. <laughs> Well, you're getting it, so don't let it bother you. I'll see you later. Goodbye. Goodbye. Oh, say, boss. Now what? Are you still going to have company for dinner tomorrow night? Oh, yes. I'm glad you reminded me. You better run down to the store and get a leg of lamb. A leg of lamb? Why don't you get a turkey? Why? After dinner, they may want to play badminton. (laughs) 
No, just get a leg of lamb and a small squab. Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs> now, let's see. Say, Jack. What? Well, a note came for you. A note? Who's it from? Dennis Day. From Dennis? What does it say? It says, Dear Mr. Benny, my mother won't let me be on the program until she talks to you about my new contract. Your loyal subject, Dennis Day. <laughs> well, how do you like that? Oh, wait a minute, Jack. There's more. More? Yeah. P.S. I found a dime today. Please let me know as soon as possible as a good, good humor man is waiting. <laughs> Imagine Dennis not showing up. He's supposed to sing. What are we going to do for a song, Don? I mean, my contract with Lucky Strike says I've got to have a song every week. Oh, Jack, I've got an idea. What is it, Don? Well, Frank Sinatra's rehearsing a special broadcast in Studio B, and maybe he'll come over and help you out. Sinatra? Yeah. Say, that would be great. Oh, Mary... Will you please go over to Studio B, and if Sinatra's there, ask him if he'll come over, will you? Will I? I'll be glad to. <laughs> Gee, am I excited. I'd better see if my stockings are straight. <laughs> or maybe Frankie'd like it better if I'd roll them down. <laughs> there, that'll do it. Let's see. Uh, Studio B is at the other end of the hall. Da 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 dee da 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 dee da 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 dee da da da. No, that's Jack's tune. He's liable to sue me. <laughs> Gosh, I bet millions of girls all over the country would love to be in my place right now, going to see Frank Sinatra. But I don't feel any different. It hasn't the slightest effect on me at all. <laughs> steady, girl. Steady. Well, here goes. All right, fellas. Uh, let's rehearse, but beautiful once more, huh? Thank you very much, fellas. That was, that was great, man. That'll be enough for today. Uh, oh, Frank. Uh, 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 Frankie. Oh, hello, Mary. Uh, uh, hello, Frankie. Uh, nice seeing you again. Nice seeing you. Gee, you sure look gorgeous today, Mary. Oh, steady, girl, steady. <laughs> uh, say, Frank, I came to ask you to step over to our studio. Uh, Jack would like to see you. Well, that's a coincidence. I was just going over to see him myself. Yeah, I'm a little peeved at him. He's ruining my singing on the hit parade. Well, I don't understand. How can Jack hurt your singing? I can't hit those high notes anymore. He puts too much starch in my collars. <laughs> oh. Well, that's Rochester's fault. Jack's specialty is rough dry. <laughs> well, that isn't my only complaint, Mary. Yesterday, my bundle of laundry came back and two of my handkerchiefs were missing. And they were the handkerchiefs that Crosby gave me for my birthday. Well, how do you know they were the handkerchiefs Bing gave you? They had chloroform on them. <laughs> Well, uh, Jack doesn't want to see you about the laundry. He'd like to have you sing a song on his program. Today? Yes, uh, right now. Well, okay. Come on, let's go over. We'll have a talk with him. Where's Jack broadcasting from, Mary? Uh, right here in Studio C. Let's go in. Okay. Wait a second, Mary. I'll open the door for you. <clears throat> Thanks, Mary. <laughs> All right, I kill turkeys, too. <laughs> and listen, Don, if Fred Allen thinks he's that funny, he's got... Oh, hello, Frankie. Hi, Jack. Do you want to see me? Yes, yes, come right in. By the way, you know my gang, don't you? Sure, sure, yeah. Where's Don Wilson? Any place you look. <laughs> hey, Don, here's Frank Sinatra. Well, hello, Frankie. Holy smoke, I'm surrounded. <laughs> yeah, there's quite a difference in your size. Oh, but... I got a goose pimple bigger than him. Now, lie down, please. Now, Frank... <laughs> Frank, I'll get right to the point. You see, Dennis couldn't be here today, so I'd like to have you sing a song on my program. Well, I, I don't know. It's... it's strictly business, Frank. I mean, I intend to pay you. You're gonna pay? <laughs> Certainly. Frank, what are you doing? I'm calling RKO. This is another miracle of the bells. <laughs> Well, you can hang up and we'll talk business. Now, how much would you want to sing just one song? $5,000. <laughs> Why doesn't he fall down? I know he fainted. <laughs> well, 
Mary, please. Well, look, Frank, for $5,000, you sing both the verse and the chorus of a song, don't you? Uh-huh. Now, look, Frank, most people don't know the verse anyway. Now, what... <laughs> look, what, uh, what would you charge... What would you charge for just the chorus? $3,000. Hmm. Well, you know, we wouldn't need a whole chorus. <laughs> I wouldn't want to be cut off the air again. Now, how much... Craggy, how much would you charge me for, say, 16 bars? $1,500. Gee, that's almost $100 a bar. Uh, can't, you, can't you give me something a little less expensive? Well, for 10 bucks, I can blow my nose and see sharp. <laughs> that might help you out a bit. <laughs> no, no, Frankie, I know you're short two handkerchiefs, you know what I'm saying? Now, look, Jack, what's the use of dickering? My price is $5,000. But, Frank, let's compromise. Look, at I'll give you $500. $5,000. $501? Yeah. $4,999. 502? $4,998. $503? Mary, what are you doing? I'm calling Paramount. This is going to be another lost weekend. <laughs> Never mind. Now, Frank, since we're so close to an agreement on price, why don't you... Why don't you just do your song and we'll settle it after the program? I mean, we shouldn't haggle in front of the audience. You know, it, it makes you look cheap, you see? <laughs> now, come on, sing your song. Huh? Well, okay, Jack. But who's, who's going to accompany me? Phil Harris's orchestra. Oh, no. No, no. <laughs> no, not that. Well, wait a minute, Frankie. A few weeks ago on my show, they accompanied Bing Crosby. I know, I know, but he already made his. <laughs> uh, well, I'll tell you what. I'll accompany you on the violin and Frank Remley on the guitar. Frank Remley? Yeah. <laughs> That's Phil Harris's nature boy. <laughs> Now, I'll get my violin. Oh, darn it. Excuse me, Frank. Hello? Hello, Mr. Billy. This is Rochester again. Oh, what is it this time, Rochester? Well, I'm listening to your program, and I just heard Frank Sinatra. That's right. He's here. What about it? Boss, you've got to get an Oscar to give back to Mr. Coleman. Yes? Well, Mr. Sinatra won an Oscar a couple of years ago in a picture called The House I Live In. Say, that's right. He did. Gee, I wonder if he'd lend it to me. He might if he hasn't thrown it away. Now, why in the world would he throw an Oscar away? Could be jealousy. It weighs more than he does. <laughs> Gee, Rochester, I'm glad you told me about it. By the way, I think you're putting a little too much starch in Mr. Sinatra's collars. He looks like a dehydrated Herbert Hoover. <laughs> be careful, will you? I will. Goodbye. Goodbye. Now, look, Frank. I'm, I'm all ready now, Jack. You get your violin look, and Frank, Look, Frank, look, Frank, let's hold the song for a minute. I want to talk to you about something very important. What is it, Jack? No, not here. Let's go out in the hall. Okay. Now, Frank, I'm not going to beat around the bush. As you know, I lost Ronald Coleman's Oscar, and I've got to get one to replace it. Yeah? Now, you won an Oscar, didn't you? Yeah, we won it for the house I live in, Jack. Well, look, Frankie, you can do me a great favor. I'll only need it for a few weeks. You see, I got to get an Oscar back to Ronald Coleman before he comes. Hey, over. would you guys mind moving over? We're trying to vacuum this hall. <laughs> in a minute, in a minute. They're always cleaning up around here. Now, Frankie. Yes, sir. I've never been in such a spot in all my life. I'm not asking you to give me the Oscar. I just want you to lend it to me until now we get. Now look, you guys. I'm trying to vacuum this corridor. I'm asking you once more to move. <laughs> Look, don't be in such a hurry, bud. Now, Frankie, look. How about it? Let me have your Oscar. Well, Jack, as long as you're in that kind of a spot and it's only for a few weeks, maybe I can arrange it. Frank. Frankie. <laughs> Darn it, he got too close to the vacuum. <laughs> Now I'll have to go outside and wait till they empty the bag. <laughs> Everything happens to me.
Gosh, where could they have emptied that vacuum cleaner? I've looked in every rubbish can in the alley here. Frankie! Frankie! Frankie, where are you? Meow. Well, he's not in this one. Meow. Go away, Kitty. I'm, wor I'm working this side of the alley. <laughs> Frankie! Well, there's nothing left for me to do. Next week, I'll just have to go over and apologize to Ronald Coleman. Meow. Ronald Coleman? Yes, yes. Good night, folks. <laughs> This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. The Lucky Strike program starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Rochester, Dennis Day, and yours truly, Don Wilson. Ladies and gentlemen, we take you out to Jack Benny's house in Beverly Hills, where we find Rochester cleaning out the attic. Well, I got all the magazines stacked up. Now I'll move this box over and... Hello, what's this? Hmm, I never saw these before. A bundle of Mr. Benny's old love letters. I wonder if I should... No, I'd be a heel if I read them. <laughs> but what's the difference? Nobody will know I'm a heel but me. <laughs> I ain't going to tell anybody. I think I'll open this pink one first. Well, look at this. My darling Blossom Boy. I have been thinking of you all day. I still thrill to the memory of how you said goodnight to me and crushed me in your powerful arms. Powerful arms. That can't be the boss. I know how excited you must be about having been elected captain of our school baseball football team, but I can't get over your reluctance to talk about it. You're so modest. Modest? <laughs> that can't be the boss. <laughs> we sure had fun celebrating your election at the ice cream parlor, and wasn't it lucky that I had my purse with me when you discovered you forgot your money? That's the boss. <laughs> Thank you for inviting me to go to the junior prom with you on Friday night, but I'd better meet you on the corner. You see, Daddy is very angry with you, and in a way, I don't blame him. I know that business is business, but why did you have to foreclose on our house? <laughs> and another thing... Oh, Rochester, I... and when you finish up here in the attic, I... What are you doing with those old letters? Uh, I'm putting them away. Rochester, have you been reading my old love letters? Oh, no, boss, not me. Well, then put them away and straighten up this pile of books in the corner. Okay, Blossom Boy. <laughs> oh, so you have been reading them. Just one of them, boss. The one that signed Eloise. Eloise. Oh, yes, yes, Eloise Stanley. Rochester, you should have seen her. Long, blonde curls, big brown eyes, rosy cheeks. And when she smiled, she had the prettiest gold brace you ever saw. <laughs> 18 carats. <laughs> now, come on, let's finish straightening the attic. Now, put that carton on top of the trunk. Yes, sir. Uh, how about putting the... Boss, what are you looking at? Yeah, this old picture album. Most of them were taken when I was a kid. Oh, yeah. Say, who's that man in this picture here? A relative? No, no, he was my first violin teacher. May he rest in peace. <laughs> And, oh, look, here's a picture of me taken when I was two years old. Look at me lying there in bed, hugging that big teddy bear. Yeah. Doggone, it's almost as big as the one you sleep with now. <laughs> Not quite. And this is my sister Florence. Uh, who's that on the other page? Oh, that's my second violin teacher. May he rest in peace. <laughs> Oh, look, here's a picture of my graduating class in grammar school. Gee, that's sure a nice-looking bunch of kids. Wait a minute, boss, I don't see you. Oh, I, I took the picture. I had a little photography business on the side. <laughs> now, look, here's a picture of our house in Waukegan. Sure is a nice place. Uh, who's the man standing out in front? 
Oh, he's my third violin teacher. Is he resting in peace? I don't know. He ran away and joined the Foreign Legion. <laughs> and Rochester, here's a picture. Oh, that must be some of my gang. We're going to rehearse here today. I'll see you later. There was a boy. They used to call him Blossom Boy. <laughs> Coming, coming. Oh, hello, Dennis. Hello, Mr. Benny. <laughs> <laughs> what, what are you giggling about, kid? Well, this morning I went out in my yard and caught a gopher. Why should I make you laugh? I got him in my shirt and he tickles. <laughs> Dennis, you got a gopher inside your shirt? No, I just said that for a joke. Why didn't you laugh? A joke? You've got no sense of humor at all. Look. No wonder you've only got one show. <laughs> Listen, close the door and come inside, will you? Am I on time for rehearsal, Mr. Benny? You're the first one here. I asked you to come a little early on purpose. Do you receive your new contract, Dennis? I mailed it to you last week. Oh, yes, Mr. Benny, but I didn't like it. What was wrong? There was two cents due on the postage. <laughs> Well, your raise will take care of that. Oh. Anyway, I, um, I'm glad you received it. Did you sign the contract? Oh, I was going to, but it hasn't come back from the doctor yet. What? My mother knows how you like to hide clauses, so she's having it x-rayed. <laughs> oh, your mother. She's never satisfied with anything. Oh, you're wrong about that. She liked the present I gave her this morning for Mother's Day. Say, today is Mother's Day. What'd you give your mother, Dennis? Oh, something she's always wanted. So I had them made for her, a set of dishes. And every dish is shaped like an L. Well, why would your mother want all her dishes L-shaped? When she throws them at my father, in case she misses, they come back to her. <laughs> L-shaped dishes. That's the silliest thing I ever heard of. Yeah, she hasn't missed in 20 years. <laughs> that I can believe. What did you get for Mother's Day, Mr. Benny? Dennis. <laughs> why? I mean, why should I get presents on Mother's Day? It's in our contracts. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. Oh, yes, yes. Gee, I don't know what to get you for Labor Day. You'll think. <laughs> You'll think of something, Dennis. Now, Dennis, what song are you going to do on the program this afternoon? Well, I thought I'd sing I'd Give a Million Tomorrows. Well, good. Now, run over it once for me before the rest of the guy gets here for rehearsal. Yes, sir. How did you like it, Mr. Benny? That was fine, Dennis, and it will probably sound even better, you know, when you... Come in! Oh, hello, Mary. Hello, Jack. Well, summer must be just around the corner when you come to rehearsal in a bare midriff. <laughs> well, at least it's comfortable. Yeah, but it must be very inconvenient. And what do you mean, inconvenient? No place to carry a gopher. <laughs> Dennis, I still. But you know, Mary... Mary, I think those, uh... I think those bare midriffs are a little immodest. Yeah. Immodest? Why, everybody out here wears them. Well, my girlfriend Gladys doesn't. That's not modesty. She doesn't want to show her tattooing. <laughs> tattooing, tattooing. One little battleship and you make a thing out of it. <laughs> the only reason you girls rest like that is to attract attention. You should talk after what you did at the beach last Thursday. You should have seen him, Dennis. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Mary, please. He put on a pair of flame-colored swimming trunks and shaved the hair on his chest to spell out Gorgeous George. <laughs> Mary, I was only having a little fun. After all, you can't Say, just... Say, boss, I... Oh, hello, Miss Livingston. Hello, Mr. Day. Hello, hello Rochester. Rochester. What is it, Rochester? I just finished cleaning the attic and I found your birth certificate. My birth certificate? <laughs> Give me that. I'll be back in a minute, Mary. I'm going to put it down in my vault. <laughs> Gee, Mr. Benny sure seemed upset about Rochester finding his birth certificate. Well, Dennis, that's understandable. You see, Mr. Benny is a big star, and people in the public eye must keep their private affairs a secret. I guess you're right. But how old do you think Mr. Benny is? I don't know, but when the pilgrims landed on Plymouth Rock, the first words they heard were, hello again. <laughs> Say, Dennis, have you signed your new contract yet? 
No, my mother doesn't like some of the clauses. And besides, she thinks it ties me up for too long. Well, how many years does Jack want you to sign up for? It doesn't say. The clause just reads, for better, for worse, till death do us part. <laughs> I don't know whether to sign it or give him his ring back. <laughs> well, I guess I'd sign it. After all, we do have a very bright future. You have another show, Bill has another show, and when Jack opens his swimming pool for the summer, I have the towel concession. <laughs> so you see, Dennis, we're really not... Say, so Mary, Mary, I happen to look out the window and there's an express trunk out in front of the Coleman. I wonder what's going on. Well, Jack, didn't you know Ronnie and Benita are leaving for England tomorrow? Gee, I didn't know that. So they're going to England, eh? Yes, and this will be your last chance to go over there and explain to Ronnie what happened to his Oscar. You're right, Mary. But, gee, I just haven't the courage to face him. Maybe if I... Get that, will you, Mary? Okay. Hello? Mr. Benny's residence, star stage, screen, and radio. Mary the Towel Girl speaking. <laughs> oh, hello, Liv. What are you doing at Grant's tomb? <laughs> Bill, where have you been keeping yourself? I haven't seen you for a couple of days. Just came in from Salton Sea. I went out there with Guy Lombardo when he tried to break the speedboat record. Gee, that must have been exciting. Yeah, it was, Livy. You should have seen Lombardo's boat. It's 25 feet long, and you ought to see that motor. Really? Yeah, what a sound when he opened her up. 1,300 horsepower going boom, 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 boom. <laughs> Do you want to speak to Jack? Yeah. Is the queen bee in the hive? <laughs> oh, just a second. I'll call him. It's Phil, Jack. He wants to talk to you. Okay. Hello? Hiya, Dad. <laughs> hey, just call to tell you I'm going to be late for rehearsal. Late? Why? Well, Sammy, my drummer, just got married, and he asked me to stand up for him. Well, I hope you made it. <laughs> So, Sammy, Sammy finally got married, huh? Was it a nice wedding? Yeah, everything went along swell. Except that just five minutes ago, Sammy took a punch at Remley because he caught him kissing a bride. Now, Phil, at a wedding, you're supposed to kiss the bride. I know, but he caught Remley doing it last night. <laughs> Stop switching old jokes, and I hope that they didn't spoil the wedding. No, <laughs> no, everything went off fine. What a classy affair, Jackson. The church was filled with flowers. Everybody was dressed beautiful. Then suddenly a hush fell on the crowd. And the bride and groom walked slowly down the aisle as the organ plays. That's what I like about the South. <laughs> oh, for heaven's sake. Phil, you mean to say the organ at a wedding, the organ played, that's what I like about the South? Well, what did you expect at a wedding? Tiger rag? <laughs> no, I guess not. Unless two tigers are getting married. <laughs> Anyway, Phil, hurry over as soon as you can, will you? I'll be there. Goodbye, Dad. Goodbye. <laughs> Phil's going to be a little late, kid, so as soon as Don comes, we'll start the rehearsal. Look, Jack, before we start, don't you think you ought to go over to Ronald Coleman's house and apologize to him for losing his Oscar? Well, that can wait till next week. But he's leaving for England tomorrow. I can't help it. This whole thing was Coleman's fault. Coleman's fault? Certainly. This never would have happened if he hadn't won the Oscar in the first place. <laughs> Believe me. Mr. Benny's right. Certainly. Mr. Coleman should be smart and make pictures like the horn blows at midnight. <laughs> Darn tootin'. Anyway, Mary, it wasn't my fault that the Oscar was stolen from me. I know, Jack, but the least you can do is go over and explain the whole thing to him. Well, okay, I'll go over to the Coleman's after rehearsal. Gee, I hope he's not too angry. <laughs> You all finished packing, Ronnie? I will be in just a minute, Benita. You know, darling, I'm really thrilled about our trip. Yes. Ah, to be in England now that James Mason's over here. <laughs> oh. oh, Ronnie. <laughs> Go on, hurry and finish your packing. Well, it won't take long. I hope we have a nice crossing. How's the weather on the North Atlantic this time of year? Mm, it's rather cold and windy. Oh, I'd better take a pair of the long ones. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, say, Benita, did you call the newspaper office and tell them to forward our copies to London? Oh, no, that'd be silly. They have all the news in the English papers. Well, they don't have little orphan Annie. Yes, they do. <laughs> Only they call her their parentless Penelope. Oh, good, good. <laughs> Day. Isn't it a shame you haven't got the Oscar to take to England with you? Oh, darling, please. My doctor told me not to discuss that. <laughs> well, don't give up hope yet. Why don't you go over and speak to Jack Benny? I mean, the Oscar must be around someplace. Things don't just disappear. Oh, oh, they don't, eh? Nine years ago, a gas man went into Benny's house and hasn't been seen since. <laughs> Now, let's, let's forget it. All right. I'll help you finish packing. I see, you'll want to take these shirts. Oh, 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 Benita, careful. I, I'll pack those shirts myself. That's quite all right. I don't mind helping. Here, let me put them in. Um, I... Ronnie! Ronnie! Look what fell from between these shirts! Your Oscar! Yes. Yes, so it is. Well, <laughs> you certainly don't seem very surprised at finding it. Uh, Benita, let's finish the packing, hmm? There's something very peculiar going on. When did you get your Oscar back? Uh, well, we'll discuss it on the boat, darling. We'll discuss it now. <laughs> tell me everything. All right, but I, I don't know all the details myself. I'll have our chauffeur tell you. Oh, Eddie. Eddie, will you please come in here a moment? Ronnie, you've had the Oscar right in this house, and you let Jack Benny suffer all these weeks? Yes. <laughs> Life can be beautiful. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm sorry you, you discovered it so soon. I could have made Benny... You, uh, uh, you wanted to see me, Mr. Coleman? Oh, yes, Eddie, yes. Uh, Mrs. Coleman has discovered our little secret, and I want you to tell her the whole story about the Oscar. Oh, that. Uh, well, you see, ma'am, Mr. Coleman was pretty fed up with Jack Benny's constant borrowing. So the night he borrowed the Oscar, Mr. Coleman tipped me off and told me what to do. While I went out in front of the house, I was hiding behind a tree. And when Mr. Benny came out of your house and walked down the side... Hey, Bud. Bud. Huh? You got a match? Yes, yes, I have one right here. Don't make a move. This is a stick-up. Mister, put down that gun. Shut up. I said this is a stick-up. Now, come on. Your money or your life. <laughs> Look, bud, I said your money or your life. I'm thinking it over. <laughs> now, look. Look, mister. And I'll take that package you're carrying, too. This package? But it isn't mine. It belongs to Ronald Coleman. He won't. Wired... down and give it to me or I'll drill you. All right. All right. Here it is. Now, lay down the sidewalk and count to a hundred. Yes, sir. One, two, three... Four, five, six, seven, eight, ten. And that's exactly what happened, ma'am. And when I brought the Oscar right in the house and gave it to Mr. Coleman. Well, thank you, Eddie. You may go now. Yes, sir. Oh, don't stare at me like that, darling. It was time Benny was taught a lesson, and I'm glad I did it. Ronnie, that was an awfully mean thing to do. And I love you for doing it. <laughs> I'm glad you see it my way. Uh, Benita, are you sure the express men picked up all the trunks? Yes. Now let's finish these valises and then we'll... Um, uh... oh, look, look, answer the door, will you, darling? I'm trying to close this bag. All right. Oh, hello, Jack. Oh, hello, Benita. I heard you were going to England, so I brought you this as a going-away gift. Oh, what a beautiful bouquet of white roses. You really like them? Why, they're my favorite flower. In fact, I have a bush of them right over the... That's funny, they were there this morning Well, I was afraid that while you were in England They might wither and die, you see So I... Uh, who's at the door, Benita? It's Mr. Benny, he's come to say goodbye Goodbye <laughs> Ronnie's in the other room. Well, 
Well, almost packed, I see. Yes, Jack, and tomorrow we'll be on our way. Ronnie, I thought on the boat, uh, you know, time might hang heavy on your hands, so I brought you this book. Here. Well, thank you, Jack. Nice of you to return it. <laughs> By the way, Benita... I want to give you a little advice. What's that, Jack? Well, while you're in England, if anyone wants to sell you any cashmere, tweeds, or woolen, grab them because they're a good buy. Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs> no, no! no wait. <laughs> wait. Look, I... I might as well... Well, I might as well tell you the real reason I came over here. The real reason? Yes, Ronnie. I... Uh, I know you won't believe this, but the night I borrowed your Oscar... I was held up. No. Cross my heart and hope my swimming pool loses money this summer. <laughs> and Ronnie, after losing your Oscar, I was so embarrassed, I did everything I could to avoid you. I was afraid you'd see me. I practically lived in hiding. Every Sunday, I had to sneak out of my house down to NBC. Then after my broadcast, I'd sneak out of the studio. Well, didn't you always do that? <laughs> Only on Sundays. <laughs> well, Jack, you know, it's funny you should be held up practically in front of our house. Oh, it was a harrowing experience. You'll never know what I went through to protect your Oscar. Would you like me to tell you about it? We'd, We'd love, love to, to hear, hear it. it. Well, the night I borrowed your Oscar, I left your house and was walking down the sidewalk, humming in my usual carefree way. Hey, bud, bud. Huh? You got a match? Yes, I have one right here. Don't make a move. This is a stick-up. A stick-up? Put down that gun, or by heaven, I'll make you rue the day that you were born. <laughs> Put it down, I say! <laughs> now, take it easy, mystery. You'll get hurt. I'm not alone. I have a ferocious lion here. A lion? That lion doesn't scare me. Quiet, you. I'll slap your teeth in. Take that! <laughs> and now for you, tough guy. Please, mister, please don't hurt me. Hey, fellas, come here! Help! Why, you sniveling, white-livered, cringing coward? Take that! Hey, fellas! Fellas, he knocked me down. Come on, help me! Okay, Chief, here we come. This guy's a tough one. We'll have to use our last resort. Give it to him! Mm. It was a long time coming, but... Mm. <laughs> that did it. That rocket bomb stunned him a little. Come on, fellas. We better get out of here. That was the last thing I heard, Ronnie. When I came to, all 500 of them were gone. And so was your Oscar. But I really did my best to protect it. Ah, uh, stout fellow. I protected that Oscar with my life. That sounds pretty good, Johnny, but it ain't the way I heard it. <laughs> what? Look, Jack, I might as well tell you. You can stop worrying about the Oscar. It was returned to me. Who? How? When? What? How? How? Who? 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 <laughs> All right now, Jack, don't ask any questions. The important thing is I got it back. Well, that's wonderful. Gee, I've never felt so happy in my life. Now, look, Ronnie... If you had to give a reward to get the Oscar back or ran into any other expense, don't worry. You're insured. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. Come on, Ronnie. We've got to finish our packing. Uh, pardon me, Mr. Coleman. Do you want me to take the Felicia's out to the car? Uh, yes, Eddie. And be sure Ronnie, to see that the... Ronnie! Look, that's him! The man that helped me out! Ronnie! Jack jumps right through the window. And look at him run. Gee, Mr. Coleman, I'm sorry I frightened him. He certainly left in a hurry. Yeah, he sure did. I'll take his shoes back to him in the morning. <laughs> Ronnie, Ronnie, ferocious lion. <laughs> Rocket bomb. <laughs> <laughs> Good night, folks. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.
The Lucky Strike program starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Rochester, Dennis Day, and yours truly, Don Wilson. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to present to you a man whose charm and personality have gained him millions of admirers. A man who's not only loved for his... Wait a minute, I must have the wrong script. This is introducing Robert Taylor. (laughs) That's right, Don. Jack has gone away on a week's vacation, and Robert Taylor is taking his place. He should be here any minute. Robert Taylor? Oh, that's wonderful. But, Mary, I still can't get over Jack's just packing up and going away on a trip. Well, it's more than just a trip, Don. Jack is spending a glorious week in New York. What made him decide to go so suddenly? He won it on the bride and groom uh, program. (laughs) (laughs) The bride and groom program? Oh, you mean that our own little Jackie boy ran off and got married? Well, not exactly, Don, but Jack figured here was a way to get a trip for nothing, so he got someone to go through the ceremony with him. But what girl would go along with a gag like that? (laughs) Mary, what are you laughing at? (laughs) He couldn't get a girl, so he hired a man with a tuxedo, and Jack wore his Charlie's aunt costume. (laughs) (laughs) With a veil yet. (laughs) Well, Mary, if it was all a gag, why didn't he come to you with the idea? He did. That's why he wore the veil. I punched him in the nose. (laughs) (laughs) Anyway, Don, till Bob gets here, I think that we... Hiya, Don Z. Hello, Livy, you little May Company Magnolia. <laughs> Hello, Phil. Hey, Livy, where's Jackson? Well, Jack won't be on the program today. Oh, he won't? What's wrong? Nothing's wrong. He just decided to take a vacation. He needed a rest. Well, it's his own fault. What? If Jackson had hired a truck instead of carrying his money to the bank, he wouldn't be so worn out. <laughs> Now, Phil, Jack doesn't have that much money. He don't, huh? When Jackson goes to the bank to make a deposit, he's carrying so many bags, the teller puts on a red cap and meets him at the door. Phil. And then the vice president grabs a microphone and yells, leave it on track five, another load for Fort Knox. (laughs) Okay, okay, Phil. You don't have to start being such a big comedian just because Jack is off this week. He got Robert Taylor to fill in for him. He got who? Robert Taylor. Oh, you mean Spangler Arlington (laughs) Brew? Spangler Arlington (laughs) Brew. Well... Wait a minute. Let's just (laughs) mull over that. (laughs) Don't get in a hurry, Liv. We can cut that up into some pretty parts, you know. (laughs) Well, Phil... That's his real name, but on the screen, he's known as Robert Taylor. How do you like that? What's the matter, Phil? Well, why does Jackson want to get somebody else when he's got me? Why, baby, I'm radio's answer to the governor of Alabama. (laughs) Me, little Filthy. Yes, uh, that's pretty thing. The kid with the soothing personality. (laughs) Phil, your personality is about as soothing as an eye wash with Tabasco sauce. (laughs) So whether you like it or not, Robert Taylor's going to be on the show. Okay, okay, but if you don't show up pretty soon, I'm taking over. Oh, no, you're not. Oh, uh, Mary, maybe we ought to check and see if Bob has started for the studio yet, huh? Oh, that's a good idea, Don. I think I will. Oh, great shoes. What is it, Mabel? The line on your switchboard is flashing. I know. Then why don't you answer it? If I do, it'll stop flashing, and it's the only thing that ever winks at me. (laughs) Well, then I'll answer it. Hello? Operator, this is Miss Livingston. Will you get me Robert Taylor's house? And please hurry, because Mr. Taylor is going to take Mr. Benny's place on the show today. One moment, please. What is it? It's nothing. It seems that Mr. Benny can't be on the show, so Robert Taylor's taken his... Robert Taylor! <laughs> Mabel Mabel, snap your eyes back in <laughs> I can't One of them is plugged into the switchboard <laughs> Here, I'll help you Imagine Robert Taylor coming on Jack Benny's program in person. What a personality. What a 
smile. Oh, he's so tall and handsome and cute. Yeah. He's sort of a Phil Harris with brains. <laughs> How can you make such an expostulation? <laughs> Phil Harris isn't even cute. Mabel Flapsaddle. <laughs> Listen, let's give credit where credit is due. I say Phil Harris is cute. Cute. Take away Alice Faye and what have you got? <laughs> 180 pounds of ham hocks and turnip greens. <laughs> Why Jack Benny isn't on the show. Do you suppose he's sick? Oh, he can't be. I saw him at the bank yesterday talking to a red cat. <laughs> Imagine Robert Taylor being on Jack Benny's program. Yeah. Why, if Robert Taylor walked down the corridor right now, I'd get to him if I had to jump through that plate glass window. Well, you can jump at him if you want to. I'll wait here and catch you when he throws you back. <laughs> Mabel, if you're trying to be funny, you Operator, can... operator. Oh, I'm sorry, but Robert Taylor doesn't answer. Well, thank you. Don. <laughs> uh, Don, Bob must be on his way over. I just called his house and he doesn't answer. In the meantime, uh, Phil, maybe we ought to... Oh, that must be Bob now. Come in. Okay, where is he? Where is he? <laughs> Well, wait a minute, mister. I don't know who you're looking for, but you must have the wrong place. No, I ain't. I'm looking for a guy named Benny. Look, bub, we're doing a show here. Now, what do you want with Benny? I married him yesterday on Bride and Groom. <laughs> what? Oh, you're the fella Jack hired to... Yeah, I want my dough. Dough? While the organ was playing Oh, Promise Me, he promised me ten bucks. <laughs> Ten bucks. It was worth 20 holding that wrinkled old hand. <laughs> well, I'm sorry, but Mr. Benny's out of town. He left right after the ceremony. Well, how do you like that? He goes on a honeymoon and leaves me here with my wife and kids. Oh, now, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it, fellow. When Mr. Benny comes back, I'm sure he'll give you the $10. And 50 cents. He made me pay for the rice. Oh, <laughs> Okay. Oh. <laughs> Say, Mary, when's Robert Taylor going to get here? As soon as the sound effect man knocks on the door. <laughs> Thanks. Come in. Hello, everybody. I hope I'm not late. Hey, kids, look who's here. Robert Taylor. <laughs> Hello, Mary. Ah, oh, Shangri-La with a widow's peak. <laughs> <laughs> Gee, Bob. I'm certainly glad to see you. Well, I'm lucky to be here. As I came down the hall, something jumped at me through a plate glass window. <laughs> a plate glass window? Oh, my goodness, Bob. Let me wipe that blood off your cheek. That isn't blood. That's lipstick. It kissed me. <laughs> oh. Well, anyway, Bob, it's certainly nice of you to come over and fill in for Jack. Glad to do it, Mary. I think you know everyone. This is Don Wilson. Oh, sure, sure. How are you, Don? That's the control booth. Don's over here. <laughs> Hiya, Bob. Nice to see you. And, Bob, I'm sure you know Phil Harris. Yes. As a matter of fact, a couple of months ago, I took his place with Alice. Wait a minute, Rollo. <laughs> <laughs> hey, nobody takes my place with Alice. <laughs> well, uh... Well, I didn't really mean that. I just meant that when you were in Denver, I took your place on the Fitch bandwagon. I know, but you wouldn't have been there if Alice hadn't have tricked me. Tricked you? Yeah, she told me she was hiring Spangler Arlington Brew. <laughs> With a name like that, I thought must, it must be a ballet dancer. <laughs> well, that's funny. I've seen you lead an orchestra, and I thought you were Gilda Gray. <laughs> Fellas, don't argue. Jack won't like us. Oh, hello, Don. Hiya, Phil. Hello, Mary. Hello, Dennis. Gee, Mr. Benny, those must be wonderful vitamin pills you're taking. <laughs> Dennis, that isn't Mr. Benny. It's Robert Taylor. Robert Taylor? Yes, I'm a ballet dancer. <laughs> <laughs> Dennis, this is Robert Taylor, the movie star. Gosh, Mr. Taylor, my mother's crazy about you. She even keeps your picture under the icebox. Under the... <laughs> To the icebox. She doesn't want my father to know she's got your picture. Oh. oh. 
The other day, my father came into the kitchen, the kitchen and oh boy, did my mother think fast. He did, huh? Yeah, when my father said, what are you doing with your head under the icebox? She said, I'm looking at the drip. Dennis! <laughs> That. Let him alone, let him alone. <laughs> Bangler Arlington Brew. <laughs> hey, tell me something, Spang. <laughs> I don't blame you for changing your name, but how'd you happen to pick Robert Taylor? Well, it was by accident. When the studio told me that I needed a stage name, I thought of a lot of them. Didn't know which one to take, so I picked one out of a hat. Gee, that's a coincidence. When I was born, my mother picked my middle name out of a hat. Really, Dennis? What is your middle name? Sweatband. <laughs> Dennis, go sit down. Well, Bob, I think it's wonderful. I think it'd be nice if everybody devoted a little time to music. I used to play a musical instrument. You did, Dennis? Yeah, but one day my mother got mad at my father and threw it at him and it got smashed against the wall. Oh, that's too bad. What instrument was it? The piano. <laughs> Well, that's, that's terrible, Dennis. Did anybody get hurt? It's just me. I was still sitting on the stool. <laughs> Dennis, why don't you go sit down and... I'll, I'll get it, Mary. Hello? Yes, operator, this is Robert Taylor. New York calling? Say, Mary, it must be Jack. Hello? Hello, Jack. How are you? I know this is long distance, but how much does it cost to say, how are you? <laughs> what'd, you what'd you call for? Not enough laughs on the program. Gee, I can't understand that. I'm really working hard. I've, I've even got my coat off. My pants? <laughs> I will not. <laughs> What's that, Jack? You want to talk to Mary? Just a minute. Mary wants to talk to you. Oh, thanks, Bob. Hello, Jack. Where are you staying? Sherry Netherlands? Oh, that's good. What are you doing? Oh, having dinner in the bridal suite? <laughs> what are you having? Oh, boiled rice. <laughs> Look, Jack, I better hang up. I'm beginning to sound like Jessel. <laughs> what? Oh, all right, I'll tell him. Goodbye. Dennis, Jack wants you to sing your song right now. Okay, Toots. Toots? I call you babe, but she's your sister. <laughs> okay, Dennis, go ahead and sing. That was Dennis Day singing Blue Shadows on the Trail from Walt Disney's picture Melody Time featuring Dennis Day. And very good, Dennis. Dennis who? Dennis Sweatband. Thank you. <laughs> Dennis, why don't you stop being so... Come in. Yeah, how do you do? <laughs> and my name is Nelson. I'm a photographer, and I was asked to come over here and take some pictures. They'll appear in the five magazines I work for. Five magazines? What are they? A peek, pick, click, look, and schnook. <laughs> well, Mr. Nelson, if you're going to take pictures, you better get started. Yeah, very well. I'll set up my equipment. Hey, Nelson, is that little black box your camera? No, it's my dark room. I've got two midgets working in there. <laughs> midgets? Yes, they're half Nelson. <laughs> Aren't you glad you asked? <laughs> and now for the pictures. I'll take Curly first. Are you ready? Anytime you are. How do you want me? Uh, profile or full? If I'd have wanted you full, I'd have caught you last night. <laughs> Nelson, you shouldn't talk that way to... Let him alone, let him alone. <laughs> anyway, uh, Mr. Nelson, Mr. Taylor is the star of the show today, so why don't you take a picture of him? Very well. Uh, will you sit here in this chair and hold your cello between your knees? Certainly. Like this? Hmm. That doesn't look too good. Uh, lean the cello on your right knee. No, no, I'm trying to get something that shows you're a great athlete, but I can't seem to get it with a cello. <laughs> Well, if, if you want something sporty, I can slide it under me and ride it side saddle. <laughs> uh, no, no, I'll think of something. Well, in the meantime, how about taking a picture of me? I'm sorry, but I don't take landscapes. <laughs> but, uh, 
you look like a good subject. Me? Yes. Did you ever have your picture taken? Only once when I was three weeks old. That was when you were a little baby. Didn't your mother take any of you growing up? Well, she didn't have to. Each year she had the picture enlarged. <laughs> In my last picture, I'm nine feet tall with a diaper on. <laughs> Say, Mary, does, does Jack go through this every week with Dennis? Why do you think he went away for a rest? <laughs> uh, Mr. Nelson, what about the picture? Yeah, I'll do it right now. Uh, come here, young man. Now, you stand right over here. Here? Yes, now hold it. What? Hold it. Very good, very good. Well, that was silly. You made me hold the camera and I took your picture. <laughs> oh, my goodness, I did it again. I've got three million pictures of myself. <laughs> well, Mr. Nelson, let's get the pictures over with so it... Oh, I'll get it. Hello? Hello, Miss Livingston. It's Rochester. <laughs> Chester, how are you? Oh, I feel all right now, but two days ago, I didn't feel so good. Oh, that's too bad. But Mr. Benny sure was considerate. He was? Yeah, while I was dusting the house, Mr. Benny came over and said, Rochester, you don't look so good. And when I told him I didn't feel good, he said, well, you better hurry up and dust the house, wash the dishes, cut the lawn, trim the hedge, sweep the porch, clean the chimney, polish the silver, wash the woodwork, wax the floors, and get right to bed. <laughs> Well, Rochester, did you finally get to bed? How could I? That was two days ago. I just finished washing the woodwork. <laughs> well, Rochester, now that Mr. Benny is out of town, I think you ought to take the opportunity to get out of the house and get some fresh air. Get out of the house? <laughs> what are you laughing at? This chain is so short, I can't even bring the milk in. <laughs> Chester, you're just making up jokes. Would I have called you if I had straight lines? <laughs> I thought so. Well, what did you call for? Uh, I'd like to talk to Mr. Taylor. Oh, just a minute. I'll call him. Oh, Bob, Rochester wants to talk to you. Okay. Hello, Rochester. What is it? Oh, oh Mr. Taylor, since you're going to be eating here for the next few days, uh, what time would you like to have your dinner? Well, would 7 o'clock be all right? Yeah, that'll be okay. And, Rochester, I'd like to have steak, potatoes, and peas. I'm sorry, Mr. Taylor. I read the contract Mr. Benny gave you, and steak ain't on it. Well, then, what do I get to eat? Potatoes and peas. Just potatoes and peas? I've got the contract right here. I'll look up the clause that says peas. Clause 5, 12, 18... Oh, here it is. 27. Is that the number of the clause? No, that's the number of peas. <laughs> Oh, well, uh, Rochester, what do I get for dessert? What? Dessert. Dessert? Yeah, that's something extra that's added to top off your dinner. Well, when did they start that? <laughs> A couple of weeks ago. <laughs> well, anyway, Rochester, as long as it's only for a few days, just give me what's in the contract. Okay, and, and Mr. Taylor, what time do you think you want to go to bed? I'll sit up and listen to the radio for a while, probably go to bed about 11. Good, good. That'll give me plenty of time to lay out your pajamas and ballet slippers. <laughs> Thank you, Rochester. I'll see you in a little while. Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs> Gee, Mary, the time is almost gone. I planned so many things I wanted to do on this program, but that photographer came in and took up all our time. Well, Bob, I've got a confession to make. I sent for him. You sent for him? But, Mary, you almost spoiled the program. Well, who cares? Now I've got pictures of me working with you so I can send them back to the girls of the May Company. <laughs> Mary, you used to work at the May Company? Well, what a coincidence. Did you used to work there, too? No, but that's where I buy my ballet slippers. <laughs> well, what a small world play, Phil. <laughs> Say, Mary, I was just looking at this magazine, Radio Best, and Jack was picked as the number one comedian. Well, how do you like that? <laughs> what are you laughing at, Mary? <laughs> Jack's off the air one week, and already he's America's favorite comedian. <laughs> 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 Good night, doll. The Lucky 
Strike program starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Rochester, Dennis Day, and yours truly, Don Wilson. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, last week the star of our show felt that he needed a vacation, so he took the week off and went to New York. But tonight... I'm happy to announce that the prodigal son has returned. And here he is, Jack Benny. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Hello again, this is Jack Benny talking. And Don, I think that was a very fitting introduction because I do feel like a prodigal son. Well, thank you, Jack, and welcome home. And it's very appropriate, too. The prodigal son being welcomed by the fatted calf. <laughs> But, Don, it's good to be back, really. Well, did you have a good time in New York, Jack? Wonderful. I saw almost everybody I knew. Irving Berlin, B. Lilly, Ed Sullivan, Fred Allen, Jack Eigen. Oh, so I... you saw Fred Allen, huh? Yeah. Well, uh, how'd you find Fred? I just pushed aside those bags, and there he was. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, Don, he has the biggest bags over his eyes. Over his eyes? Yeah, he's wearing them in an up suite this year. <laughs> got tired of stepping on him. <laughs> but you know, I saw Fred at his broadcast, and it's really amazing how lucky he's been. What do you mean, lucky? The way he ran a case of sinus into a million dollars. Honestly, Don, the way Fred talks, he sounds... Well, hello, Mary. Hello, Jack. Welcome home. Well, that's a fine welcome home. Haven't you got a great big kiss? I had one, but last week I gave it to Robert Taylor. <laughs> All right, so couldn't you save a little kiss for me? Jack, when Taylor takes over a show, he takes it all. <laughs> well, I will say one thing. He did a wonderful job. And so did you, Mary. You were great last week. I was in New York and I heard it. The kiss? No, the show. <laughs> anyway, I had a wonderful vacation in New York. You know, this year they're having one of the most successful theatrical seasons they've ever had. They charge a lot of money, you know, for their tickets, but it's worth it. What shows? A Streetcar Named Desire, High Button Shoes, Inside USA, and Mr. Roberts. Oh, uh, gosh, Jack, I certainly envy you. How, how did you like A Streetcar Named Desire? Well, I, I didn't get to see that show. <laughs> I'm sorry I missed it. Oh, that's too bad. But, Jack, I'll bet you enjoyed High Button Shoes. I heard it was a great musical. Yeah. Well... <laughs> didn't see that one either. You see, before I knew it, it was Thursday night, and that was the night I was going to see Mr. Roberts. Well, Jack, when I get to New York, that's the show I'm most anxious to see. Mr. Roberts? Yes, yes. How'd you enjoy that? <laughs> well, that's the one I'm really sorry I missed. <laughs> you see, I got as far as the lobby, and the girl in the box office made me so mad I wouldn't go in. What'd she say to you? 660, please. <laughs> 660, please. 660, please. Some smart Alex since you took over the show last week. 660. Anyway, money had nothing to do with it. Henry Fonda, the star of Mr. Roberts, gave me two passes. I wish I hadn't sold them. <laughs> now, what about you, Mary? Anything happened uh, with you while I was away? Oh, nothing much, except that I received another letter from my mother. Your mother? Well, what does the Republican dark horse of Plainfield have to say? I've got it right here. Do you want me to read it to you? No, but you're going to do it anyway, so go ahead. Huh? All right. <coughs> My darling daughter, As Mary. Alan would say, if you didn't read it, this program will be short. You know, go ahead. Read it. <laughs> Says it every week, the same thing every week. Go ahead, I'm sorry. My darling daughter, Mary, mm -hmm. I received your letter, and I want to thank you for sending me $25 for Mother's Day. You're so generous. What other girl would send her mother a whole week's salary? <laughs> Gee, you are generous. Huh? Mary, I bought myself a dress with some of the money. And with the rest of it, I bought Papa a beautiful monogram wallet to keep his unemployment checks in. <laughs> and, and that reminds me, hmm? your sister babe is no longer on vacation. Hmm? A couple of weeks ago, she got a telegram from John L. Lewis telling her to go back to work. <laughs> 
Good old babe. I'll never forget her in the Easter parade, strolling down the avenue with that lamp on her hat. <laughs> Jack, please. Oh, I'm sorry, Mary. Continue. I heard you on the program last week, the broadcast you did with Robert Taylor. And I must say, it was a wonderful show without Jack. Hmm. It was the first time in five years that my airwick took a Sunday off. <laughs> news, so we'll close now. Your loving mother, Nature Girl Livingston. <laughs> you know, Mary, your mother writes some of the silly. Oh, hello, Don. Hello, Mary. Well, hello, Dennis. Gee, Mr. Taylor, I don't know what happened to you since last Sunday, but you look awful now. <laughs> Dennis, for heaven's sake, I'm not Robert Taylor. Look over here. I'm Jack Benny. Oh, I don't blame you for being mad. <laughs> Dennis, aren't you happy that Mr. Benny's back? I certainly am. You know, Mr. Benny, while you were gone, I sure missed you. Well, thanks, kid. You know, you wouldn't believe it, but I was like a lost soul. I felt awful. I couldn't even eat. Well, that's a shame. Yeah. Next time you go away, you ought to pay us in advance. <laughs> Dennis, you've got a lot of nerve suggesting anything like that. After all, Mary was on last week's program, too. She didn't mention anything about being paid. Oh, she doesn't care about money. She got kissed by Robert Taylor. <laughs> what? He wouldn't even put his arm around me. <laughs> Dennis. I may not look like much, but he ought to taste my potato pancakes. <laughs> Dennis, stop being so silly, will you? And get ready for your song. Okay. Mary, before I forget, will you wait and drive me home after the broadcast? Where's your car? Well, I'm thinking of getting a new one, so I sent Rochester out to see if he can get a good trade in, you see. I hope that he Hiya, can. Hiya, Livy. Hello, kid. Well, look who's back, little boy Blue Eyes. <laughs> Hiya, Jackson. Hello, Phil. How's Encino's answer to it pays to be ignorant? <laughs> That's one he didn't know was in there. <laughs> we had another one written in. wasn't nearly as funny. As this one. Huh? Oh, I'm fine, Dad. I am. <laughs> Glad you're back, Dad. Yeah. What'd you think of the program we did last week without you? I thought it was an excellent show. I thought Robert Taylor did a wonderful job. Who did a wonderful job? Robert Taylor. You don't by any chance mean Spangler Arlington Brew. <laughs> yes, what about it? Spangler Arlington Brew. Oh, Spangy. <laughs> what a name, Brew. Before I met him, I didn't know whether I was supposed to shake his hand or blow the foam off him. <laughs> well. Anyway, what'd you have to get him for when you got me? Me, the one and only inimitable Harris. Well, you're not inimitable. It's just that nobody wants to be like you. <laughs> I'm surprised you pronounced it right. Now, look at Dennis. Wait a minute. What? I don't care what you say. I'd much rather be like me than Spangler Arlington Brew. Oh, for heaven's sake, Phil. What do you got against Robert Taylor? Burns me up. He's married to a beautiful actress. He's a good-looking guy. He's got nice, wavy hair and a great personality. So what, Phil? You're married to a beautiful actress. You're a good-looking guy. You've got nice, wavy hair. And you've got a great personality, too. I know. <laughs> Well, what about it? Nothing. I just wanted to hear you say. <laughs> I mean, I mean, huh? All right, Phil, I said it. Now, Dennis, let's have... Phil, are you taking bows or is your head so big it keeps bending you over? <laughs> now, come on, Dennis, let's have your song. Well, what do you want me to sing? I don't know. What do you got prepared? Potato pancakes. <laughs> All right, sing that. Sing anything, will you? Talk to you. That was Haunted Heart sung by Dennis Day. Very good, Dennis. And now, ladies and gentlemen, an answer to thousands of requests is our feature attraction tonight. We are going to repeat our version of that great Universal International production, The Egg and I. Jack, how come we aren't doing a new play tonight? Because in order to do a new play, it has to be written. And my writers lost their typewriter at the opening of Hollywood Park. <laughs> Now, in this sketch, I will... All right, so they lost their typewriter at the races. Couldn't they dictate the script to their secretary? They lost her, too. <laughs> she looked so forlorn as they pushed her through the $5 window. 
Now, with this sketch, I will play the part of... Oh, darn it. Hello? Hello, Mr. Billy, this is Rochester. Oh, hello, Rochester. Have you done anything about trading my car in? Yeah, I was busy all morning. First, I took it to Madman Munch. He looked the car over very carefully, but he didn't offer much. Well, how much did he appraise it for? Of course, when a car gets that old, they don't appraise it, they weigh it. <laughs> drove over to Honest John's place. He looked at the car and offered us $10.75. Well, of all the nerve, the license plate alone is worth that much. That's the only part he wanted. <laughs> hmm. uh, Trifle discouraged, but undaunted, I drove to the Smiling Irishman's lot. And there's where we had a little tough look. Why, what happened? As the Smiling Irishman climbed into our car to inspect it, he slammed the door and the fender fell off. Which fender? The fender. The fender. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Then what did you do? I decided to go home. Uh-huh. And while I was driving down Wiltshire Boulevard, something went wrong with the steering wheel, and the car ran right into the La Brea tar pit. Oh, that's terrible. Worse than you think. The pit threw it back out again. <laughs> Rochester, I expect you to sell the car today. You can try it again tomorrow. Yes, sir. Goodbye. Goodbye. Now, come on, kids. Let's get on. <laughs> Let's get on with our play. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we will proceed with our version of The Egg and I. In this sketch, I will be Fred McMurray, and Mary Livingston will be Claudette Colbert. What part am I going to play, Jack? Well, Don, the scene takes place on a farm, so you can play the part of our pig. <laughs> Oh, Jack, every time you do a farm sketch, I play the part of a pig. I want to do something else. Well, what would you like to be, Don? A canary. <laughs> Don, you a canary? P, 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 P. No, that's not so bad. <laughs> All right, Don, you can be the canary. And now, ladies and gentlemen, the egg and I. As the scene opens, we find the newlyweds, Claudette and Fred, driving out to their new home. <laughs> Gee, Claudette, I hope you like the new farmhouse I bought. Oh, I will, Mr. McMurray. You can call me Mac. <laughs> you know, honey, I can't believe we're really married at last. Yeah, it was such a wonderful wedding ceremony, but you were so nervous. I was not nervous. You were, too. You put the ring on your own finger, kissed the best man, and gave the preacher a potato pancake. <laughs> well, a friend of mine makes them. <laughs> But, darling, wasn't it exciting as we drove away from the church with those old shoes tied in back of the car? Yeah. I wonder what made them bounce like that. My mother was still in them. <laughs> oh, yes, I cut her loose when we went through Anaheim. They can always use another smudge pot there. <laughs> oh, look, there's our farmhouse. Here we are. Look, darling, there's our new home. Gee, it sure looks run down. Yeah, but we'll fix it up. There's the real estate man. Oh, mister. Mister. How do you do? <laughs> uh, how do you do? I just bought this house. You're the man from the real estate office, aren't you? Yes, Nelson's the name. I'm here to show you around. Gee, what a peculiar style of architecture this house has. It's not French Normandy. Is it early American? No, crummy colonial. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Let's go inside. Come on, honey. All right. I'm talking to my wife. <laughs> oh. Uh, just follow me, folks, and I'll show you through the house. Uh, this is the living room. Uh, this is the dining room. And this is the bedroom. Gee. Uh, Mr. Nelson, does the bathroom have a tile floor? Shall we go out and see? <laughs> oh. uh, Mr. Nelson, I'd like to see the kitchen. Right through this door. There, isn't it a beauty? Well, I don't know. The stove looks very old and awfully dirty. Oh, that's just a little dust. I'll blow it off. Uh, 
mister. Have you tried Sen Sen? <laughs> Well, it's getting kind of late. I better go. Goodbye, Mr. Nelson. Goodbye. Goodbye, Mr. Nelson. Mr. Nelson, stop kissing her. Well, if Robert Taylor doesn't care, why should you? <laughs> well, darling, here we are in our own little home. We better start getting to sleep, too. On a farm, you know, you have to get up at four in the morning. You're right, sweetheart. But it's so nice to be alone, just the two of us. Yeah. Well, darling, good night. Good night. Get out of here! <laughs> Darling. <laughs> Darling, you're snoring. No, no, that's the rooster. It's morning. Oh, oh. Well, you hurry and get breakfast ready. I'll go out and milk the cows. It's a good thing I slept in my clothes. My, it's pitch dark this early in the morning. Now, where's that milking pail? Now, oh, here it is. Easy, bossy, easy. That's a good girl, bossy. Easy, bossy, easy. Gee, I can't seem to find... Uh-oh, wrong end. <laughs> Now, easy, bossy, easy. <laughs> now, hold still, Mel, while I fix the pail and screw it. <laughs> We're really going to be cut off the air tonight. <laughs> There, bossy, there, that's a good girl. Hold still while I fix the pail and stool. There. Oh, la, 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 la. 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 Hmm, better change. <laughs> I'm not, but I think the cow is. <laughs> hey, what are you holding? Oh, look, I just found it. It's a black kitten with a white stripe down its back. Well, shucks, if that isn't the cutest little... Kitty, have you tried Sen Sen? <laughs> now, Claudette, don't stand around. We gotta feed the animal. Okay. Beep, 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 beep. Oh, look, Fred. Isn't it cute the way our canary follows us around? Yeah, now, shoo, canary, shoo. We gotta feed the chickens. Here, chick, 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 chick. Here, chick, chick, chick. Come on, Chick Chick. Here's some corn for you. Oh, Fred, look at the hen sitting on the nest. There. Oh, yes. Now we got to get breakfast. Well, I better get some oats for the horse, hay for the cow, and... <laughs> what happened? Our canary stepped on the pig and killed it. <laughs> Gee, that's too bad. Beep, 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 beep. What a canary. I should have gotten suspicious when he bent the bars in his cage. <laughs> now, let's get... Oh, look, here comes someone. Hello? Howdy, neighbors. Howdy. Zeke cares as my name live right over the hill. <laughs> well, do you have a farm over there? Yep, I raise little of this, little of that, mostly corn. For your pigs? No, for my still. Oh, you have a still? Yeah, she'll make 20 gallon a day. 20 gallon a day? That isn't much. Ain't bad, my old lady don't drink. <laughs> We'll 
moved in here, Zeke. How long have you been living around this section? Well, little lady, let me see. Now, I moved here in 1918. <laughs> it's 1948. That's, uh, that's 16 years. Wait a minute, Zeke. From 1918 and now it's 30 years you've lived here. We don't count the 14 years of prohibition as living, son. <laughs> Got any children? Yep, I got two sons, but we ain't seen them since they ran away with the circus ten years ago. Sure, miss the boy. <laughs> well, it's a shame both of them left. Maybe one of them will come back. Ain't likely. They're Siamese twins. <laughs> oh, Siamese twins. Yeah, right? they're pretty attached to each other. <laughs> oh, Zeke, you're the barnyard's answer to Phil Harris. <laughs> Hiya, neighbors. Howdy, Zeke. Good to see you all. Well, hello. How are you? Uh, Ma Kettle's the name. Live right down the road. Which house? No house, just down the road. <laughs> no house? Yep, she's married to Paul Kettle, the laziest man in the state. He's the laziest man in the world. He won't even pick his teeth. <laughs> I had to go down to the store and pick them for him. No kidding. Well, what do you know? Here comes Paul Kettle, the lazy critter now. Name is Dennis, but folks call him Paul. Hiya, Paul. Hiya, Zeke. Hiya, folks. Ma, put your arms around me and squeeze me. I feel like exhaling. <laughs> there, Better that, talk a little faster or we won't get better. off the show. <laughs> Well, that feels better. Any place to lie down around here? Oh, Paul, stand up for a while. Oh, by the way, what are you folks figuring on raising here? Chickens. I wouldn't try it if I were you. Tried to raise some myself a few years ago. Never had any luck. What happened? I bought ten hens. They laid up a lot of eggs, but none of them ever did hatch. How many roosters did you have? Oh, roosters! <laughs> hmm. Well, I guess I better be going along now. Got to go home and help my pig write a letter. Your pig writes letters? I just tell him how to spell. He already has the pen and oink. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Pork Kettle, you're sharper than a potato pancake. You said it. Well, look, folks, my husband and I are just going in to have breakfast. Why don't you come in and join us? It's okay with me. Me too. Pick me up, Ma. Well, come on, let's all go in. Hey, wait a minute. What happened to Zeke? Where's Zeke Harris? Oh, he had to run along. He's got his own show. <laughs> What? I can stay till Wednesday. <laughs> well, good, good. Come, folks. Breakfast is on me. On you? Yes, we haven't got a table. <laughs> oh, Claudette, you've only been on the farm one day, but you've got corn all over you. You said it, and we just made it. Come on, everybody. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I want to take this opportunity to thank Robert Taylor for taking my place on the program last week. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. The Lucky Strike program starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Rochester, Dennis Day, and yours truly, Don Wilson. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, we'd like to take you out to Jack Benny's home in Beverly Hills. It's evening, and Jack has just finished dinner and is relaxing in his usual way. You know, Rochester... I always like to play my violin after dinner. Uh -huh. you know, it soothes and relaxes me. Uh -huh. I, I hope it doesn't bother you. Oh, no, I haven't had my dinner yet. <laughs> good, good. Rochester, I often think what a fool I was not to have made the violin my career. You know, I might have become a great virtuoso, but no, no. Instead, I had to become a comedian, a clown, a buffoon. But a rich buffoon. <laughs> That's the wrong attitude. The world would be better off if people had a different viewpoint. You know, money isn't everything. Remember what Shakespeare said. He who steals my purse steals trash. I wish you'd throw some of that garbage on me. <laughs> 
Rod, just clear off the table. Let me practice my violin. I want to prepare for my stage appearances in Detroit and Cleveland. Let me see. I want to learn that new song first. Here it is. First again with Tobacco Man. <laughs> Gee, that song is catching on fast. I heard it last night on the hit parade. <laughs> Well, I've practiced enough, but I don't feel like going to bed. I think I'll go in the den and listen to the radio. <coughs> now, hello, Polly. Daddy's going to listen to the radio. Fred Allen stinks. Fred Allen stinks. <coughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe I shouldn't have taught her that. But then, she'd have found out herself. <laughs> Yeah, I wonder what's on the air right now. Friends, do you have a tendency to be a little too fat around the waist? You do? Well, what you need is exercise. First, stand in front of your fireplace. That's right. Now lift your right leg. Higher, higher, higher. Now rest your foot on the mantelpiece. <laughs> Have you got one foot on the floor and one foot on the mantelpiece? Good. We now leave the air until the same time tomorrow. That's ridiculous. I wonder what else is on. Gee, it's hard to reach the dial with one foot on the mantelpiece. <laughs> there, I made it. This is Blanche Stewart, your daily beauty consultant. Ladies, is your skin rough and dry? Are your pores large and coarse? Is your complexion dull and blotchy? Is your hair stringy and full of snarls? It is? Well, stay in the house, kid. You're a mess. <laughs> I don't know, there, there must be something on the air tonight besides commercials. Oh, there's a phone. Hello? Hello, Jack. Oh, hello, Mary. Jack, are we going to have rehearsal at your house or NBC? What? Are we going to have rehearsal at your house or NBC? Mary, I can hardly hear you. Get closer to the phone. I can't. I've got one foot on the floor and one foot on the mantelpiece. <laughs> <laughs> Gee, that program must have a terrific hooper. <laughs> I think so, Ram? <laughs> oh, Mary, what did you ask me before? I said, where are we having rehearsal? Oh, rehearsal will be tomorrow at NBC. Okay, goodbye. Goodbye. Oh, say, Jack. Yes? I've got the most wonderful news. My sister Babe is coming out to California to go on television. Your sister Babe on television? Well, what is she going to do? She's going to double for gorgeous George. <laughs> <laughs> say, that's great. Well, I think I'll take my change belt off and go in the library. <laughs> I'll read for an hour or so before I go to bed. Just look at this room. What a mess. Oh, Rochester. Rochester. Every time I want him, he takes so long to Did get... Did you call me, Mr. Billy? Yeah, where were you? I was in the kitchen ironing your nightgown. Uh, well, I hope you didn't put too much starch in it again. Last night, I felt like I was sleeping in a Quonset hut. <laughs> I, I like a nightgown to cling a little. <laughs> now, Rochester, this room is such a mess. I wish. Rochester, do you smell something burning? Uh oh, the iron! My nightgown! Well, is it burned? Boss, oh, something tells me this Quonset hunt is going to have a window in it. <laughs> Let me see that nightgown. Hmm. It'll be okay, boss. I'll put a flap on it. <laughs> See that you do. I'm going back in the library and read. I'll call you, Rochester, when I want to go to bed. Now, let me see. I'd like to read a good mystery for a change. What are these books? Kiss the blood off my hand. <laughs> the crushed skull. 
The mutilated torso. <laughs> Lilacs in the spring. <laughs> nah, that's too gruesome. <laughs> Let's see. Oh, my goodness, these two books shouldn't be together. The Proper Bostonians and the Kinsey Report. <laughs> Here's a mystery I haven't read. I was framed by the author of I Stand Condemned. <laughs> Gee, his new book ought to be good. I'll just curl up in this easy chair and read it. Chapter One. I was framed. My name is Bruce Fink. Oh, it's an ordinary name. It hasn't even been mentioned as a Republican candidate. <laughs> I was an average man with normal habits. My only fault was, perhaps, that I spent my money a little too freely. Gee. <laughs> it all started one evening last April. We had just finished dinner, and I was in the kitchen washing the dishes. My wife, Flossie, was in the parlor dancing with our boarder, Silk Shirt Harry. <laughs> I also had a son named Gus. Some people thought he was stupid because he was 16 years old, and he had just learned to tie his shoelaces. <laughs> Someday he may even learn to tie them when they're in his shoes. <laughs> but I loved him. That evening, Gus was helping me with the dishes. What's this, Papa? That's, that's a cup, son. Oh, and is this a saucer? No, 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 that's a knife. Saucer knife. Saucer knife. Saucer knife. Have you got that, son? Son? Yes, you're my son and I'm your father. <laughs> this is a cup and this is a knife. The one with the point is the knife. The one with the handle is the cup. And the one with the hole is your head. <laughs> Now, do you understand? Yes, son. No, no, no. Yo, no. No, look, look. You're the son. You see, I'm your father. But don't try to learn too much at one time. All right, I'll go to bed now. Good night, my boy. Good night, Papa. Oh, Papa. Yes, son. Papa, when are you going to tell me about the birds and the bees? Don't worry about the birds and the bees. First learn about the cups and the saucers. <laughs> They enjoy life, too. <laughs> Good night, Gus. Good night, Papa. Gus called me Papa. And I was glad that I made the right decision. Two days before, I almost traded him for a Cocker Spaniel. <laughs> I put away the dishes and started toward the parlor to join my wife, Flossie, and our boarder, Silk Shirt Harry. <laughs> Ah, swing it, Flossie, you little dove, you. <laughs> I'm way ahead of you, Harry. <laughs> <laughs> hey, honey, let's try that dip again. Oh, you sure got a mean rug. That's nothing, baby. You ought to catch me on linoleum. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Harry, hold me closer. I love to smell that bay rum. <laughs> <laughs> I know, baby. That's why I drink it straight. <laughs> Mind if I cut in, sweetheart? Are you finished with the dishes already? Oh, yes. They're all washed and put away. Look, Fink. Flossie and I are busy. Here's a dime. Why don't you run down to the store? What do you want me to get? Lost. <laughs> I walked out of the house smiling at Flossie's little joke. Then I was horrified to see our son Gus lying on the front lawn with a broken leg. I know what had happened. When he went up to his room, he stepped out on the balcony to get some fresh air. If I told him once, I told him a thousand times. We haven't got a balcony. <laughs> As I bent over him, Gus opened his eyes and said... What happened, son? No, 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 you're the son. I'm your father. Oh. Tell me, are you hurt? Yes, I think I broke my saucer. <laughs> That's your leg. As I walked down the street toward the corner store, I couldn't help thinking how lucky I was. I had a wonderful wife, 
a son with a broken saucer. <laughs> and a boarder who had his own show and went off the air for the summer. <laughs> What man could ask for more? Although I had never cared for riches, I did wish that I could afford to buy my wife, Flossie, the little extra thing she never had before, like toothpaste, a toothbrush, or even tea. I continued walking down the street when suddenly a voice called to me from the darkened doorway of the First National Bank. Hey, you. You. Who, me? Yeah, you. Come here. You want to make 50 bucks? Without even thinking, I said no. Which proves I wasn't thinking. <laughs> so I thought it over and said... Did you say 50 bucks? Yeah. All you got to do is stand out here in front of the bank, and if you see a cop, just whistle. Whistle? Yeah. Whistle something like Melancholy Baby or Ballerina, any popular number. If you don't mind, I'd like to whistle Stardust. I'm a friend of Hugo Carmichael. <laughs> Whistle ballerina. And when you see a cop come and whistle loud so me and my friend can hear you. They weren't fooling me. I knew they were song pluggers. <laughs> I stood in front of the bank thinking of the $50 I was going to make. To me, that was a fortune. The nearest I ever came to being rich was when I almost guessed the name of the walking man. <laughs> I was so sure it was Frank Remley. <laughs> He fell off his stool for the summer. I stood there lost in thought, when suddenly from inside of the bank, I heard... The bank now had an open-toed vault. <laughs> the next thing I knew, I was in a speeding car, seated between two men and three sacks of money. Then suddenly it dawned upon me. This was a holdup. <laughs> The rest of that ride was like a nightmare. Then the two men began to talk. Hey, Clyde. How much... How much did you promise this fink? They knew my name. <laughs> I looked at the men, then I looked at their guns. I noticed the guns were identical. So I asked them why they both carried 32 caliber automatics. And they said... They're first again with hold-up men. <laughs> I knew what they meant, but I missed the music. I leered back at them and said, You fellas can't get away with this. I'm going to the police. You can't go to the police, buddy. You're in this as deep as we are. I knew that the two men were right. I was trapped. Through no fault of my own, I, Bruce Criminal, was now a fink. I mean, Bruce Fink was now a criminal. <laughs> I rode along with the three sacks of money. The car stopped at a corner. The men picked up two more sacks. One was Sacks Fifth Avenue. <laughs> the car was now so crowded, I had to sit in the back with the escalator. <laughs> Finally, they threw me out of the car. By the time I got home, it was morning. A dreary morning. I looked up at the sky. Suddenly, the sun broke through the O in Honest John. <laughs> Through the window, I could see Silk Shirt Harry holding my wife, Flossie, in his arms. Their lips were pressed together. I dreaded going into the house. I'd been gone all night, and I couldn't tell them where I'd been. And I didn't want Flossie to think that I was in love with another woman. <laughs> I racked my brain, but I couldn't think of an excuse. So I decided to go in and brazen it out. As I opened the door, they were still kissing. As they saw me, their lips parted. <laughs> Hello, Harry. Hello, Flossie. Are you back already? I know how you must have worried about me, darling, but I couldn't help it. I bumped into an old friend and we got to talking. And you know how time always... Kiss me again, Harry. Okay, baby. <laughs> it was as simple as that. <laughs> no questions. No jealous reproaches. Flossie trusted me implicitly. I think Harry did, too. 
I was heartsick as I went upstairs and threw myself on Gus's bed and knocked my pivot tooth out. If I told him once, I told him a thousand times. He hasn't got a bed. The next couple of weeks were like a horrible dream. I didn't know what the future had in store for me. I continued with my household duties. One day, as I was pushing bugs out of the screen with a toothpick, my son Gus was sitting nearby doing his homework. He looked up at me and said, Oh, fathead. That's father. At least you're getting closer. What is it, son? This pencil won't write. That's a knife. Look, son, that's a knife. This is a cup and this is a saucer. Do you understand? Yes, son. No, 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 no. I'm your father. Now, how, how are you getting along with your spelling? Fine. I can count up to ten now. Good work. Now, listen, my boy. I'm going to take you into my confidence. Some men were robbing a bank, and they promised me $50 to whistle if I saw a cop. A what? A cop. That's a saucer. <laughs> I left Gus sitting in a pool of blood. <laughs> I couldn't stand them anymore. As I walked into the kitchen, the phone rang. A shiver went down my back. Then it went up my back. Then it went down my back. The escalator was under my coat. <laughs> the phone rang again. Hello? Hello, Fink. We're pulling another job tonight, and we want you to whistle for us. And you better be there if you know what's good for you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, I'll be there. I thought of running away. I thought of leaving town. I thought of Jane Russell. I don't know why I thought of her, but it was fun. <laughs> but when the burglars called, I knew I'd be there. This meant I'd have to leave the house again. But I didn't know how to break the news to my wife. I hoped she wouldn't take it too hard. I opened the door and walked into the parlor where I found Flossie and Harry looking at our picture album. Oh, look at this one, Harry. This is a picture of me and my husband, Bruce, the night we first met. <laughs> yeah. Hey, who's the other guy in the picture? That's Ralph Edwards. He introduced me to Bruce as part of my consequence. <laughs> Bossy, dear, I have to go out again tonight, and I may not be home until late. <laughs> and look, Harry, here's a picture we took on our honeymoon. This is Bruce in his bathing suit. Holy mackerel, what a physique. He looks like something that was pushed through a screen with a toothpick. <laughs> 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 oh, I don't blame you for being furious, Flossie. But you'll have to trust me. And remember, no matter what happens, I want you to know that I love you. Well, I gotta go now. Goodbye, Harry. Goodbye, Flossie. How about a kiss? Not wanting to interrupt them. <laughs> I tiptoed out of the room. Once again, I walked out into the night to keep a rendezvous with destiny. <laughs> that night while I whistled, they robbed the second national bank. The next night, they robbed the third national bank. The night after that, the fourth national bank. And the following night, the sixth national. Everyone was expecting it to be the fifth. Oh, they were shrewd, all right. <laughs> and then... It happened. The crooks decided I outlived my usefulness. They took me to a lonely road to bump me off. And I stood there helpless. They came at me with their guns drawn. I tried to get away, but it was no use. I was cornered, trapped. I screamed for help. Ah! Suddenly, from out of nowhere, police cars appeared. Then the cops jumped out. I thought I was saved, but no, they thought I was one of the crooks, and they started firing. I was hit in the arm, in the leg. I sank to my knees when suddenly... When suddenly... When suddenly... Hmm. The last page of this book is missing. Wait, quite a few pages are gone. Oh, Rochester! Rochester! Did you call me, boss? Yeah. What happened to this book? There were about a dozen pages torn out of it. You did that last week when you had your dinner party. What? If I told you once, I told you a thousand times, buy paper napkins! <laughs> well, if you got the flap on my nightgown, I think I'll go to bed. Good night, Rochester. <laughs> Yeah, it feels good to get in bed. I'm really tired tonight. Oh, down it, there's the buzzer. Oh, now, who can that be at this hour, I wonder? Yes? 
Mr. Benny, if I told you once, I'd told you a thousand times. What is it? This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. The Lucky Strike program starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Rochester, Dennis Day, and yours truly, Don Wilson. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight the entire Jack Benny troupe is leaving for personal appearances in Detroit and Cleveland, opening Thursday at the Fox Theater in Detroit. As we look in on the Benny household, Jack is packing for the trip. Rochester, did you put in my shaving cream brush and talcum powder? Yes, sir. My razor? Uh Uh-huh. I put in everything but your razor blades. How many do you want to take? Better take two. I'll be gone 12 weeks. (laughs) Two will be enough, I think. Boss, how many shaves do you get out of one razor blade anyway? About 75. 75 shaves out of one blade? How do you do it? It's a little secret of mine, Rochester. For the first 50 shaves, I don't take the paper off. (laughs) I ought to take along something light and cool for my stage appearances. Shall I pack your gray garbadine? No, no, no. I'll take my white linen suit and I'll wear a blue tie. That sounds like a nice combination, white and blue. Huh? Uh-huh. Then if you wear your red toupee, you'll look like old glory. <laughs> no, no, I'm saving that for the 4th of July. Now, let's see. <laughs> you know, boss, I'm awfully excited about going to Detroit. I'm getting a new car. A new car? Gee, I wish I could afford one. <laughs> How much is it going to cost you? $2,100. Twenty-one? Rochester, where'd you get that kind of money? Well, it's like this. Uh, I've been with you 11 years, and by skimping, I've saved half my salary every week. And then last week, it happened. You finally got enough? Yeah, my uncle died and left me (laughs) $2,000. Well, you see, Rochester, I told you when you started, stick with me, you'll be well off, you know. Now, let's, uh, come in. Well, Joey and Stevie. Hello, Mr. Benny. Hello, boy. What brings you here today? We came over to say goodbye. Well. Go ahead, Stevie. Okay, okay. Mr. Benny, we, the members of the Beverly Hills Beavers, have brought this going away present to you, our fellow beaver. Well, gee, fellas, thanks. Shall I open my present now or on the train? Open it now. Okay. Oh. (laughs) <laughs> Just what I've always wanted. A frog. <laughs> yeah, what a pretty frog. It sure looks swell. It looked even better when it was alive. <laughs> well, fellas, I certainly appreciate the sentiment, and I'll keep it with me as long as the weather stays cool. Uh, so long, boys. Goodbye, Beaver Benny. Well, I guess we're about finished packing Rochester. I wonder if Don Wilson is through with his yet. Now, you better finish that letter you're writing to Mr. Benny. Well, I I am finished. Would you like to hear it? Yes. Okay. Dear Jack, I have talked it over with a little woman, and I've come to the conclusion that an announcer of my reputation should be treated with far more dignity on the program. Well, that's good. Continue, darling. For several years now, you've been getting laughs at the expense of my excess weight. I have just about reached the limit of my endurance and must warn you that I am now serving notice that from this day forward, I will not tolerate any references to my obesity. That's telling him, fatso. (laughs) Now I'll get your stamp. Oh, you needn't bother. I'm going to tear it up. Tear up the letter? Well, don't you want Jack to stop making up jokes about you being fat? (laughs) Well, let's be honest, darling. My lard is our bread and butter. (laughs) (laughs) That's what I like about you, Donald. You're so cute in a sloppy sort of way. (laughs) I know. Pauline, have you packed all my stockings and nightgowns? Yes, ma'am. Good. Now, put this eyebrow pencil in my cosmetic case. Oh, I already packed your eyebrow pencil. I know, but I better take two. Mr. Benny always forgets his. (laughs) See, Miss Living, 
Captain, do you mind if I ask you a personal question? No, what is it, Pauline? Is there anything between you and Mr. Denny? I mean, has he ever gotten romantic with you? Well, uh, once, a couple of years ago, he drove me up to Mulholland Drive one night, parked the car, looked at me, then said, Mary, I'm going to take you in my arms and crush you to a pulp. Then he put his arms around me and squeezed and squeezed. Gee, what happened? He broke two of his ribs. <laughs> Then he's never gotten romantic. Well, Mr. Benny ought to start thinking of getting married real soon. He's 39 and he's not getting any younger. <laughs> the way he counts, he's not getting any older either. <laughs> now, hurry, Pauline. I have much time. Oh, gee, Miss Livingston, I sure envy you making this wonderful trip and being on the same train with Phil Harris. Oh, you really have a crush on Phil, haven't you, Pauline? Oh, yes, Miss Livingston. Every time I see Mr. Harris, I wish I was only two inches tall. Only two inches tall? Why? I'd like to take off my shoes and run barefoot through his hair. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Pauline. But, you know... <laughs> You know, Pauline, he has got nice hair. I first noticed it when I saw a picture of him and Alice Faye in a magazine ad. Bill and Alice? What kind of an ad was it? Oh, you've seen them. Under the picture, it says, which one of these twins has the Tony? <laughs> <laughs> I wonder where Phil is. I've been trying to get him on the phone all day. Hey, gosh, Frankie, just think in a couple of hours we'll be on that super chief bound for Detroit. Yeah. Gee, Curly, I can hardly wait. Two more scotch and waters, bartender. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh... Hey, Frankie, what time is it? Uh, four o'clock. What time we come in this joint? Three o'clock. That ain't so bad. We've only been here 13 hours. <laughs> Set him up again, bartender. Here you are. Hey, Frankie, I think I ought to call up Alice and tell her where I am. Why, Curly? Well, I don't want her to think I'm wasting my time in a pool room. <laughs> I'll call her later. Okay. You know, Curly, I've been thinking and thinking for weeks and weeks, and I just realized something. What? You and me are a couple of bums. <laughs> <laughs> well, we ain't so bad. Another round, bartender. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm not too happy about this trip, Curly I'll probably be lonesome in Detroit You'll probably spend all your time with Benny Nah, you can't have no fun You can't have no fun running around with Jackson His idea of a big time is standing on the street corner Trying to whistle at dames Trying a whistle? Yeah, it takes him a half an hour to pucker up those wrinkled old lips. <laughs> no kidding. Yeah, and by the time he does get them puckered, he's too pooped to blow. <laughs> two scotches and water, bartender. Two for me, too. <laughs> hey, Frankie, look, it's getting late We ought to get to that station I'll go out and call a cab No, let's have another drink and float down <laughs> We ain't got no time Hey, bartender, how much do I owe you? $475 Okay, charge it to my account $475? You know, Curly, that's kind of expensive Yeah, but look at the money we save on food <laughs> Come on, we're supposed to pick up Dennis Dale on the way to the station Let's get out of here Well, let's see. I've packed all the new things that I bought in the store today. Two shirts, two ties, two pair of socks, two handkerchiefs, and 36 pair of shorts. <laughs> Gee, that guy in the underwear department was a good salesman. <laughs> I don't mind buying all this underwear, but I wish I'd gone to the men's department. <laughs> Call him already now. Oh, mother! Mother! Your mother isn't here, son. Who are you? Your father. <laughs> oh, where's mother? Uh, she's not home, son. She'll see you down on the train. 
Oh, has she gone to Detroit? No, only to Albuquerque. Then a new engineer takes over. <laughs> Albuquerque? Yes. Well, I better tell her if an Indian tries to sell her any jewelry to look under the blanket, it might be Mr. Benny. Uh. <laughs> yes, I'll tell her. Well, son, I'll kind of miss you when you're gone. And I'll feel kind of funny letting you go on the road alone. Oh, you needn't worry, Dad. I'm with Mr. Benny most of the time. With Mr. Benny? What do you do? Well, we stand on street corners and he winks and I whistle. <laughs> what? And if a girl stops, he faints and I run. <laughs> well, I'm ready to go now, Dad. I'll wait on the porch for Phil Harris. Oh, son, before you go out, you know that song I like so much, May I Never Love Again? Yes. Uh, would you sing it for me? Okay, son. No, no, you're the son, I'm your father. <laughs> I'll go ahead and sing. Well, Mary, here we are at the Union Station. How much is it, driver? That'll be $1.95. $1.95? Here's $2. Keep the change. <laughs> Thank you very much. You're quite welcome. Mr. Benny, do you mind if I say something? No, 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 go right ahead. You're tighter than the ice cube tray in a $12 refrigerator. <laughs> what? Come on, Mary, let's go in the station. Train leaving on track five for Anaheim, Azusa, and to Kamanga. <laughs> Train leaving on track five for Anaheim, Azusa, and to Kamanga. Yeah, I told the gang to meet us over by the information desk. Say, Jack, there's Dennis over there weighing himself. Oh, yes. Dennis! Dennis, what are you jumping out of that machine for? I put a penny in, but no peanuts came out. Hey, that's a weighing machine. It's a scale. When you put a penny in, and a little card comes out. There it is down there. Oh, yeah. Gee, look, I weigh 155 pounds. And Dennis, on the other side, is your fortune. My fortune? Let me see. Gee, now they tell me. What does it say? No peanuts. <laughs> For heaven's sake, look, kid, you better take care of your baggage and I'll see you on the train. Come on, Mary. Jack, I think I'll go over and buy some magazines. Okay, in the meantime, I'll go over and validate the tickets. Attention, please. All passengers going to Anaheim take sandwiches as there is no diner. <laughs> All passengers going to Azusa take soft drinks as there is no club car. All passengers going to Cucamonga take the bus as there is no train. <laughs> I don't know what magazine to buy. Hiya, Livy, you one-way ticket to dreamland. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hello, Phil. What are you buying? A mystery magazine. Hmm, here's one that looks good. Who's Gordon? That's House and Garden. <laughs> <laughs> oh. the magazine I want, the one with Robert Taylor's picture on it. Robert Taylor's picture? Yes. You mean Spangler Arlington Brew? <laughs> no, Phil, I don't mean Spangler Arlington Brew. <laughs> I mean Robert Taylor. What are you seeing, Bob Taylor, anyway? Well, what is Alice seeing you? Livy, if I stood here telling you, we'd both miss the train. <laughs> well, that does it. See you later, Phil. Okay, Liv. Attention, please. The station master just received a complaint about our service. So from now on, all the weighing machines will give peanuts. <laughs> now, let's see. Where's that ticket window? Oh, yes, there it is, right over there. Your attention, please. We have an announcement from the Lost and Found Department. Will the owners of these pets please claim them? We have a dog, a horse, a woodpecker, and a pig. That's all, folks. Oh, 
I'm glad Rochester's taking care of my parrot. Attention, please. Attention. Leaving on track three, the southbound special for New Orleans, Memphis, Mobile, Birmingham, and do what diddy <laughs> Now, let's see. This must be the ticket window right here. Oh, mister. Mister. Yeah. <laughs> Are you the agent? Well, how do you think I got all these tickets? Speeding down Wilshire Boulevard? <laughs> look, look, I got a ticket to New York, but I want to arrange for stopovers at Detroit and Cleveland. Detroit and Cleveland? What a coincidence. My parents were in Detroit when I was born in Cleveland. <laughs> Wait, how could your parents be in Detroit when you were born in Cleveland? We had a stork with a lousy bombsite. <laughs> what? Aren't you glad you asked? <laughs> now, listen. Look, all I want you to do is validate my tickets. Uh, that... Pardon me a moment. I'm in a hurry. Do you all mind if I go ahead of you? No, no, no. Go right ahead. Uh, what can I do for you, sir? Well, I'd like some information about do what diddy uh, Yes, sir. What would you like to know? Well... Is old Bob still there with all the news? Yes, yes, he is. Does he still wear that box back coat and the button shoes? He certainly does. And not only that, he's all caught up with his union dude. <laughs> hey, look, mister. Anything else you'd like to know? Uh, yes. Do they still have those baked ribs and candied yams and those sugar-cured Virginia hams? Ooh, do they? <laughs> and basements full of those berry jam. No. You keep out of it. <laughs> Pardon me. And now what else would you like to know? Well, before I get to do our ditty for those backbones and butter beans, does the train stop so I can sip that absinthe in New Orleans? You can bet your layer cakey it does. <laughs> well, that's all I wanted to know. Give me a ticket to Pismo Beach. <laughs> Here you are, sir. Hmm. To him yet, he's got to be nice already. What are you mumbling about? Look, mister, all I want you to do is validate my tickets. Very well. Pullman, P, upper U. Here's your reservation, P, U. <laughs> look, mister, look, I got a good notion to report you to the company. Oh, I wish you wouldn't. They don't know I'm working here. <laughs> I thought so. Now, give me those tickets. Attention, please. The Santa Fe Super Chief now leaving on track nine. Uh, what? Jack, Jack, hurry up! Coming, Mary, coming! Attention, Jack Benny, attention. Huh? You left your briefcase at the taxi stand. Oh, my goodness. One of the drivers is bringing it to you. Yeah, I never even missed it. Oh, here comes the taxi driver now. Oh, buddy, buddy, here I am, right over here. Oh, gee, thanks a lot, buddy, for bringing me my briefcase. I certainly... Wait a afraid. minute, wait a minute. I, I know you. Huh? I, I, I drove you down to the station last time. You did? Well, give me my briefcase. I've you're, got it. A... You're not going away again, are you? <laughs> Jack, the train, the train! Look, buddy, my oh, train... Why do people have to go away? <laughs> I, I can't stand saying goodbye. Buddy, buddy, my briefcase, please. If I give it to you, you'll go. <laughs> I can't go through that again. You went away once before. Look, look, it wasn't me. You must be thinking of somebody no, else. No, no, no. It was you, all right. <laughs> How could I ever forget those big blue eyes? <laughs> I know. Now, look, bud. Let go of my briefcase or I'll miss my train. All right. All right, here. Take it. Take it. I'm coming, Mary. I'm coming. <laughs> Why do I have to be a taxi driver Always see people go away. <laughs> Attention, please. On track seven, the chief now arriving from Chicago. Arriving? Oh, goody, goody, goody. People are coming back. People are coming back. <laughs> Next Sunday, we'll be broadcasting from Detroit, Michigan, where we open our personal appearance tour at the Fox Theater on this coming Thursday, featuring Phil Harris, Rochester, and that metro Golden mayor glamour star, Marilyn Maxwell. Good night, folks. <laughs>
Lucky Strike program starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Rochester, Dennis Day, and yours truly, Don Wilson. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight we're broadcasting from Detroit, Michigan, the automobile capital of the world. But yesterday, they raised the prices of new automobiles, so today we bring you the walking man, Jack Benny! Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Hello again, this is Jack Benny talking, and Don, you're right, I haven't got a new car, but it's not that I haven't tried. You see, there's still an awful shortage. Oh, that's right, Jack. It's almost impossible to get a new car. You're not kidding, Don. This morning I saw Kaiser and Fraser, they were both riding bicycles. <laughs> and that hyphen between their name was on roller skates. <laughs> But, gee, I'd, I'd give anything to pick up a new car here. Well, Jack, I'm quite sure I can help you get one. How? Well, uh, I don't like to brag, but I carry quite a bit of weight in this town. <laughs> well, I wish you... Don, would you mind repeating that? I said, uh, I carry quite a bit of weight in this town. Don, you carry... Th no, I won't say it. I won't say it. No, we were number one in the Hooper last week. Why take any chances? <laughs> anyway, Don, thanks for offering to help me, but I'm sh not sure I'd like to get one of the latest model cars. They're so revolutionary. You know, no cranks in front or anything. <laughs> really. And another thing, they've made so many radical changes in the designs. Have you seen the rear end of the new Cadillac? Yes, why? It looks like two salmon swimming upstream to spawn. <laughs> 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 Believe me you know? Well, anyway, Jack I'm glad we finally took this trip to Detroit You know, I've needed a new car for three years And I'm going to get it now Well, Don, if you needed a car so badly Why didn't you get it back in Hollywood? I mean, why did you have to come to Detroit? For a fitting <laughs> Oh, yes, Don I, Yes, I forgot You do need a new car Your old one is a little tight Around the luggage compartment <laughs> Maybe you can let out the fenders, you see. And, uh, oh, hello, Mary. Hello, Jack, Don. Hello, everybody. Well, well, Mary, how do you like it here? Huh? Oh, wonderful, Jack. Simply wonderful. To me, Detroit is one of the greatest cities in America. Well, you really do like it here, huh, Mary? Yes, Don, I love Detroit. First city of Michigan. First in automobile production and fourth in the American League. <laughs> Ooh, Mary, I... Mary, I didn't know you were interested in baseball Well, I am And Jack, the other day I went out to Briggs Field And I've got some bad news for you What is it? Greenberg isn't on third anymore <laughs> Ooh, I... I must tell my writers They think Ty Cobb is still out in left field there <laughs> Mary, have you seen many other things here in town? Oh, yes, Don. One of the places I visited was the Ford factory. You know, Ford sponsors Fred Allen. Gee, I can't understand it. A progressive company like Ford going back to the Model T. I mean... <laughs> And why should he be on the air for Ford anyway? With that receding forehead, he looks like a Studebaker. <laughs> Oh, Jack, why don't you stop picking on Fred and admit that he's a very good comedian? Oh, he is. He's a very good comedian. <laughs> yeah, but I don't think that Fred should be on the air for an automobile. Fred should be sponsored by a ball-bearing company. You know? Why? Because every time I hear him, my stomach turns. <laughs> Now, let's stop talking about him. <laughs> okay. Anyway, Jack, yesterday I went out to the soda plant and I met the cutest engineer. I went out with him last night. The, at the DeSoto plant? Did you have fun? Yeah. But you know, it seems that everyone around here is always thinking and talking in terms of automobiles. What do you mean, Mary? Well, this fellow took me out in the park, and we sat down on a bench in a dark corner. Then he looked into my eyes and said, Honey, do you know you have the nicest, shiniest pair of headlights I've ever seen? <laughs> no. Yes. Then he looked at my lips and told me I had a great paint job. What technique? <laughs> and then he put his finger on my nose, pushed a little, and 
was awfully disappointed when my hat didn't go up. Gee. Then he kissed me and it did. <laughs> well, he kissed you. It serves you right going out with a strange man. Oh, Jack, I was properly introduced to him. And anyway, the only reason I went out with him is because I thought he might help me get a new DeSoto. No such luck. Well, say, Mary, uh, maybe I can help you get a car here in Detroit. Oh, Don, that would be wonderful. Do you think you can do anything? Certainly. I carry quite a bit of weight in this town. <laughs> well, Don, I'd like... Wait a minute. Uh, would you mind repeating that? I said, I carry quite a bit of weight in this town. Don, you carry so much... No, I won't say it. I won't say it. <laughs> My landlord may be listening in. He's looking for an excuse to evict me. <laughs> Mary, I want to commend you on your good taste. You know, I had the same opportunity and... Oh, hello, Dennis. Hello, Mr. Benny. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Gee, I'm glad you made it on time, kid. You know, I haven't seen you since we arrived in Detroit. Well, that's right, Dennis. What have you been doing with yourself? Oh, I've been spending most of my time in my hotel room. Have you got a nice place? Oh, it's all right. I got a room with hot and cold running. <laughs> hot and cold running water? I don't know. There isn't any bathroom. <laughs> Dennis, you mean you're staying in a room with no water? Uh-huh. Well, what do you do when you need a bath? Keep away from people. <laughs> You take him, Don. Somehow he seems to tire me. I don't know. <laughs> okay, tell me, Dennis, are you staying at the Book Cadillac Hotel? Oh, no, that's too expensive for me. Well, where are you staying? At the Book Chevrolet. Now, cut that out! <laughs> now, instead of all that silly talk, let's have your song. Okay. Now, go ahead and... Oh, hold it, Dennis. Come in. Oh, Don, we were supposed to have an interruption here, but we left the actor in Hollywood. Sing, Dennis. Go ahead. <laughs> Now, it's Dennis Day singing his latest RCA Victor recording, Mama McCushlin. Very good, Dennis. By the way, kid, I meant to ask you, how'd you like the train trip from Hollywood to Detroit? Not so good. I shared a compartment with Phil Harris, and I couldn't sleep a wink. You mean Phil kept you awake? Oh, no, I had the upper berth, and it was awfully uncomfortable. I could hardly move in it. I didn't get any sleep at all, and I tried everything. I even went to bed early. Well, what time, uh, what time did you have the porter put your berth down? Oh, down! <laughs> Oh, nuts! <laughs> you must have been pretty tired on the train, Dennis. I was. I'd wake up in the morning and my eyes would be just as red as Phil's and I didn't have half the fun. <laughs> well, kid, I hope... I hope you... I hope you're getting enough sleep now that you're here in Detroit. No, I'm in a pretty terrible hotel. I'd like to get rooms at a decent place, but they're all booked up. Could you help me get a room, Mr. Benny? Well, I don't think so. I don't know many people here in Detroit. Well, now, perhaps I can help you, Dennis. I carry quite a bit of weight in this town. <laughs> Gee, that would be... Would you mind saying that again? I said, uh, I carry quite a bit of weight in this town. You carry so much... No, I won't say it! I won't say it! I have another show in Hollywood, and I want it to be there when I get back. <laughs> That's the first sensible thing you've said today, kid. You know, if you would just... Come in. Hello, Mr. Benny Boy. Well, if it isn't Mr. Kitchen. Mr. Kitzel, what are you doing here in Detroit? Well, I came here to show something to the automobile manufacturers. I have the most wonderful automobile. Really? Yes, it runs on the ground, it runs under the water, it flies through the air, it even climbs up trees. Gee, that's wonderful. When, when did you get an automobile like that? I always had it, but I never knew it would do all those things till my wife drove it. <laughs> I see. Is it a brand new car, Mr. Kitzel? No, no, Chester. <laughs> it's an old car. It's a Rolls Canardly. Uh, a Rolls Canardly? Yes, it rolls down one hill and can hardly get up the next. <laughs> Mr. Kitzel. Oh, excuse me. That's a joke I heard on the radio on the Ozzy and Horowitz program. <laughs> oh, that's Ozzy and Harriet. Well, Mr. Kitzel, 
Are you are you leaving town right away? No, no, no. I'm thinking of staying here and playing with the Detroit Tigers. You're going to play with the Detroit Tigers? Why? Who knows? Maybe ten men will help. Now, wait a minute. Now, wait a minute, Mr. Kitzel. You see, every baseball team has its off days. Oh. That's why they're starting to play here at night, you see? <laughs> And by the way, Mr. Kitzel, before you leave town, I want you to come over and see my stage show. You know, we're playing here at the Fox Theater this week. Phil Harris, Rochester, the Sportsman Quartet, and Marilyn Maxwell. Yeah, I know. I saw it the first day I got into town. And that Marilyn Maxwell, if you'll pardon the expression, hoo, hoo, hoo. <laughs> oh, she certainly is beautiful, isn't she? Yes, and what a shape. This is the first Maxwell I ever saw with a body by Fisher. <laughs> well, she'll, uh, she'll really ac uh, appreciate the compliment, Mr. Kitzel. <laughs> I'll tell her when I see her. And it was nice of you to drop in to see my stage show. Well, I've seen it nine times already since I arrived here in town. Well, nine times. Yes, tonight I hope I can get a room. <laughs> Well, maybe after the show I can help you, Mr. Kitzel. Oh, thank you, Mr. Benny Boy. Goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye, Mr. Kitzel. Hey, Jack. What? I meant to ask you, are you getting a straight salary at the Fox Theater or are you working on a percentage? Well, I get a percentage on every ticket that's sold. Why? Well, a note came to you from the manager of the theater. What does it say? It says, uh, Dear Jack, you were right. The total attendance yesterday was 22,307 instead of 22,306. <laughs> How you can count with that spotlight in your eyes, I'll never know. <laughs> of course I was right. I only made one mistake since I've been here, and that wasn't my fault. There was a man sitting in the fifth row of the balcony with two heads. <laughs> one of them was asleep on his own shoulder. <laughs> Imagine us writing that without George, huh, fellas? <laughs> You know, Mary, uh, counting the house is one of the first things I've ever learned. So far, folks, this show has smelled, but now Harris is here and I'm jet propelled. <laughs> Turn it on me. I feel it. Oh, what a town is Detroit. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, for the benefit of the few of you who haven't been blown out of your seats, this is Whispering Jack Smith. <laughs> Hello, Phil. Ah, oh, hiya, Jackson Dennis. Ah, oh, Livy. Lovely Livy. <laughs> oh, look at that streamlined chassis with those beautiful accessories. Hello, Phil. I know it's silly to ask you, but have you been enjoying yourself here? <laughs> love it, Livy, love it. You know, Detroit's a great town, and just think, this big city, all these millions of people, all these big factories, these thousands of workers, none of them would have been here today if Marconi hadn't invented the automobile. <laughs> Phil, for your information, Marconi didn't invent the auto. He invented radio. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Imagine me making a mistake like that when I know so much about inventors. Oh, fine. Well, if you don't believe me, go ahead. Ask me any question you want to about them inventors. Okay, who invented the electric light? Edison. Hmm, pretty good. Who invented the telegraph? Morse. Hey, that's right. Who invented the cotton gin? Gordon. <laughs> I knew it couldn't last. Well, listen, Jackson, what? if you think that's bad, you should hear what Remley did. He's been waiting for years to come here and get a car so it would be FOB Detroit. Well, what's wrong with that? He thinks FOB means full of bourbon. Ha ha ha. Oh, Harris, you're just like the new Oldsmobile. Beautiful but shiftless. <laughs> Look, Phil. Well, you can save those jokes for our stage show. If the people don't like them there, you know, they can walk out. Here, we got them trapped. Hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. That reminds me. Uh, Look, Jackson, I got a squawk about my billing coming at that theater. Why, what's the matter, Phil? Plenty. Plenty's the matter. I took pictures of the marquee, and my name ain't even on it. Now, here. Look. Let's see. Fox Theater now showing Jack Benny and... Oh, for heaven's sake, Phil. Look, here it is, right on the second line. P-H-I-L-H-A-R-R-I-S. Phil Harris. Oh, is that what that spells? <laughs> yes, 
Ben, listen, while we're talking about... Say, Mr. Benny, you want to see something funny? Huh? Put your finger on my nose and push. What? Put your finger on my nose and push. Okay, there. <laughs> Dennis, what happened? Yesterday I was going through one of the automobile factories and my head got caught in the assembly line. <laughs> Oh, go sit down. Okay. And stop pulling your ear. I'm turning my lights off. <laughs> oh, be quiet. Now, Phil, getting back to our vaudeville show, I got a couple of complaints to make, too. Such as what? Such as when you do that love scene with Marilyn Maxwell. When you kiss her, why do you have to kiss her so long? Listen, Jackson, you ain't paying a girl nothing. Let her have some fun. <laughs> You think kissing you is fun, huh? Certainly. You don't think I hung on to Alice with just my lousy music? No, you? no. <laughs> well, look, Phil, let's not discuss your love life. I'm talking about our vaudeville show. Another thing, I don't like the way you deliver some of your jokes. You're pressing too hard. Okay. I'll watch it, Jackson. You know more about that than I do. And don't make such a slow exit after your number. Get off the stage fast. It'll help your applause, you see? Okay, I will. You know more about those things than I do. And another thing, I think your tempo is much too fast when you sing That's What I Like About the... Now, song. hold it, Dad. Hold it. <laughs> huh? I don't mind you telling me how to deliver jokes. Look, Phil. And I don't mind you telling me how to make an exit. Phil, But I... telling me how to sing That's What I Like About the South is like Henry Allrich telling Dr. Kinsey about the birds and bees. <laughs> Phil, Phil, I didn't mean... I didn't mean to offend you. Anyway, Jack's right, Phil. I don't think your band sounds good. Well, I know it don't, but it ain't my fault, Liv. That theater has an awful piano. We'd sound a lot better if it had a good one. Well, I'm sorry, Phil. I can't help you there. Well, maybe Don can help me. Hey, Donzie, can you help me? You carry quite a bit of weight in this town. <laughs> yes, I, uh... Hey, wait a minute, Phil. Would you mind repeating that? I said, uh, you carry quite a bit of weight in this town. I sure do, Phil, especially around my suburbs. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Wilson, you may take up half the stage, but you're worth it. Yeah. <laughs> well, Don, you finally got your little fat joke in, didn't you? Are you happy now? <laughs> huh? Oh, there's the phone. I'll get it. Hello? Hello, Mr. Bay. This is Rochester. <laughs> Hello, Rochester. What'd you call for? Well, I've got some bad news for you. What is it? I'm at the hotel and one of your trunks is missing. There are only two here. Oh, my goodness. Which one of the trunks was lost? The one with the strap around her or the one with the rope? The one with the scotch tape. <laughs> well, what have you done about it? Well, I called your insurance company and the adjuster is here now. I'm giving him a list of the things that were lost. First, your blonde toupee with the cowlick. My blonde toupee? Oh, I've got two like that. Which one do you mean? The one that makes you look like an aging Van Johnson. <laughs> Oh, gee, that was my Saturday night one. I know, boss. And, uh, I'm charging them $30 for it. Well, wait a minute, Roger. That toupee only cost me $3. That's what the bait costs, but look at the time you spent trapping it. <laughs> well, I consider that a sport. Now, what else was lost, Rochester? One electric line, iron, soap, starch, bluing, and laundry tickets. Gee, that's too bad. Well, boss, I'm kind of glad we lost all that laundry stuff, especially now that we're traveling and have no washing machine. Why? I get awful tired sitting in a bathtub full of clothes and kicking my feet. Well, that's good exercise, Roger. Wait a minute. I hope we didn't lose the trunk that had my violin in it. That was it, boss. And the man is allowing you $12 for that. $12? Roger, the violin bow alone is worth $12. The horse hair in it came from Whirlaway. I told him that. What did he say? He said he wouldn't give you $12 for that bow if Whirlaway was still attached to it, Eddie R. Carroll was riding it, and it was five lanes ahead in the Kentucky Derby. <laughs> well, what did he say about my violin? Oh, he wasn't original at all. <laughs> well, I'll take that up with the insurance adjuster myself. And I'll see you later. Goodbye. Goodbye. Oh, say, boss. Now what? Would it be all right if I took the night off? I'm kind of anxious to go over to Canada. Well, I guess it'll be all right, Rochester. It is, a, uh, it is a pleasant drive across the Ambassador Bridge. Oh, I'm not going across the bridge. I'm going through the tunnel. Tunnel? 
Is there a tunnel under the Detroit River? Yeah, doing prohibition, Phil Harris dug it with his bare hands. <laughs> Oh, yes, I remember he bit his way through the last two miles of it. <laughs> Goodbye, Rochester. Goodbye. I never saw anybody like Rochester. Every time I leave town, he loses something. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank everybody for being so nice to us here in Detroit, and we'll be at the Fox Theater till Wednesday. So come in and let Jack count you. Yes. <laughs> and we hope to see all our friends in Cleveland when we open at the Palace Theater Friday. And next Sunday, we'll be broadcasting from the Carter Hotel in Cleveland, Ohio. Now, let's see. What else? Oh, Jack, a note just came from your room clerk at the hotel where you're staying. The room clerk? What does it say? It says that, Dear Mr. Benny, I took the matter up with the manager, and he says the price of your room cannot be reduced as no one asks you to launder the bed linen yourself. <laughs> hmm. However, we're curious to find out why every piece of your linen has Rochester's footprints on it. Gee, I told Rochester he was kicking too hard. In <laughs> Cleveland, I'll have to make... I'll, I'll, I'll make him wear socks. <laughs> Good night, folks. This is NBC... The Lucky Strike program starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Rochester, Dennis Day, and yours truly, Don Wilson. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Jack Benny and his gang are appearing this week at the Palace Theater here in Cleveland. Right now, Jack is in his dressing room in Rochester. is helping him make up for the next stage show. Let's look in on him. Uh, Rochester, how long do you... Ouch! Uh, how long do you think it'll... Ouch! Be before... Ouch! Ouch! Boss, hold still or you'll knock the tweezers out of my hand. <laughs> All right, but try to go... Ouch! It's your own fault, boss. If you'd buy a razor blade, I wouldn't have to pluck out your whiskers. <laughs> I can't get this close a shave with a razor. Okay, I'm through now. Good. I have to go on stage again in a half hour. Gee, I'm glad business is so good. It was swell in Detroit, too. What was the total receipts of the box office in Detroit, Roger? We took in $93,267.43 and a Hoover button. <laughs> A Hoover button? Who put that in? Hoover! <laughs> Hoover? Yeah, he ain't worked in 16 years. <laughs> oh. Now, Rochester, I'd like oh, to... Oh, say, boss, you better give me a little more petty cash. I had to pay the cleaners $3 and a half. Oh, oh, I didn't even know my stuff came back from the cleaners. Where is it? Well, I folded your slacks and put them in the trunk. Mm -hmm. I brushed your coat and put it in the closet. And I parred your hair and put it in the drawer. <laughs> oh, is that my hair? I've been throwing it breadcrumbs all morning. <laughs> now, hold still, boss, while I finish making you up. I gotta put a little more mascara on the eyes. Uh, there. Thank you, Rochester. You know, during our last show yesterday, when the spotlight was shining on me, I heard a woman in the second row uh, turn to her friend and say, Oh, Mildred, don't his eyes look like twilight on the blue waters of Lake Erie? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't blame her, boss. Your eyes are really beautiful. I know. It's a shame. <laughs> It's a shame you have to blink and close them every once in a while. <laughs> yes, especially here in Cleveland. There's so many people who paid to see them, you know. <laughs> anyway, you better finish the... Come in. Oh, hello, Mary. Hello, Jack. Hello, Rochester. 
Chester. Hello, Miss Livingston. <laughs> Jack, uh, I brought you some coffee and sandwiches. Thanks, Mary. What are you laughing at? <laughs> well, you'll find it out soon enough, so I may as well tell you. You know that big life-size picture of you out in front of the theater? Yeah. <laughs> well, some kid with a crayon drew a mustache, whiskers, and long curls on it. <laughs> Low. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you look like a cocker spaniel with padded shoulders. <laughs> Oh, that's terrible. A thing like that can hurt business, you know. <laughs> and they're on a percentage, too. <laughs> oh, calm down, Jack. You weren't mad in Detroit when someone touched up your picture in front of the Fox Theater. Well, that was different. I'll say it was. They painted a fan in each hand, and you broke the box office record. <laughs> yeah, that picture even fooled me twice. I bought tickets myself. <laughs> uh, by the way, boys... I've been meaning to ask you, do you want me to go out and buy you a pair of those elevator shoes? What for? Well, when you do your love scenes on the stage with Miss Marilyn Maxwell, she's taller than you are. Oh, well, that doesn't bother me. Well, it should. I caught the show from out front, and you certainly couldn't prove that love scene you do with Marilyn. What do you mean? Well, when you kiss her, you're supposed to put your arms around her and tenderly draw her up close to you. Huh? You're not supposed to grab her by the earlobes and pull yourself up. <laughs> Earlobes, earlobes. Why don't you stop making things up? I'm finished with your face, boss. Here's a mirror so you can see how you look. Well, say, you did a wonderful job, Rochester. Gee, there isn't even a trace of a wrinkle. What'd you use, a new wrinkle cream? No, putty. <laughs> putty? <laughs> Mary, what's so funny? Before a man can make up your face, he has to join the plasters union. <laughs> Look, Mary, I'm nervous enough as it is without you coming in here and all... Oh, my goodness, everything happens at once. There's the door and there's the phone in the other room. I'll get the phone. I'll answer the door. Oh. How do you do? My name is Mink. I'm the manager of this theater. Oh, oh, won't you come in, Mr. Mink? Thank you. You know, you look uh, very familiar. It seems that I know you. Well, you should. I used to be in vaudeville, too. You and I were on the same bill together in Sandusky. Say, that's right. In 19... Uh, 1928. Nin I'll never forget it. You were celebrating your 39th birthday. <laughs> uh, no, 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 no. I wasn't 39 years old. See, I threw that party to celebrate what a sensation I was that week. We took in $39. Thirty-nine dollars. Yeah. Huh? Oh, um... That's all right. I said... With good luck, we may have a party here. Yeah, with good luck, you'll be here on time. So I... <laughs> Rochester. <laughs> anyway, uh, Mr. Mink, I do remember you as... <laughs> I do remember you as a vaudeville actor. How, how come you gave it up? Well, I just played it smart. I saw my act was falling apart. I was getting old. I was washed up, so I quit and became a theater manager. Gee, I... I wonder if... <laughs> no, no. <laughs> what is it, Mr. Benny? Well, I thought maybe if you spoke to someone of the theater owners, you could... No, why... Why should I do anything for Fred Allen? I mean... <laughs> Anyway, thanks for dropping in, Mr. Mink. You're quite welcome. It was nice seeing you again. Oh, by the way, when I'm working on the stage, I wish you'd turn the microphone up a little higher. People can't hear me beyond the third row. Oh. Well, as soon as we get people beyond the third row, I will. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Oh, Jack. What? Jack, I'm glad I answered the phone. It was my sister, Babe, calling from Plainfield. Oh, your sister, Babe, huh? Yes, and she has a wonderful news. She thinks she's engaged. Babe thinks she's engaged? I mean, doesn't she know? Well, she's not sure. Her oh. boyfriend got down on one knee, but just as he started to speak, the battery and her hearing aid went dead. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what a shame. Is there any other news from home? Yes, Babe told me that she was... Oh, see who's at the door, Rochester. Yes, sir. More excitement in here. Is Mr. Benny in Rochester? Yeah, come right in. Oh, boss, it's Miss Maxwell. Well, hello, Marilyn. Come on in. Sit down. Well, thank you. Hello, Mary. Hello, Marilyn. 
Look, Jack, I don't like disturbing you in your dressing room, but I had something I wanted to talk to you about. Oh, that's quite all right. What the... Uh, hey, what... Marilyn, how come you're wearing your hair down like that? To cover my earlobes. They're six inches long now. <laughs> Well, they were certainly pretty when we started. I mean, <laughs> but, Marilyn, I do want to thank you for your cooperation during this tour. You're really lending a touch of beauty to our vaudeville engagements. Well, thank you, Jack. Uh, Jack's right, Marilyn. I caught the first show at the palace, and you certainly looked beautiful in that black gown. Oh, you mean that strapless one? Yes, it's really gorgeous. That's right, Marilyn. And all week long, I've been meaning to ask you something about that strapless gown. Uh, what, uh, what keeps it up? The Cleveland Censor. Oh, oh. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. You, you must have brought your own writer with you, I think. Now, Mara, what number are you going to sing in the next show? Hooray for Love. Oh, oh. that's a new one. Yes, yes. <laughs> yes, Mary, would you like to hear it? I certainly would. Well, all right, here goes. Oh, just a minute, Marilyn. Come in. Mr. Benny? Yes, who are you? I'm a hard carrier. I brought you some more makeup. <laughs> oh, good. Just dump it in the corner. Go ahead, Marilyn. Let's have your song. Well, that's a wonderful song, Marilyn. Wonderful. I'm sure the audience will like it. Well, thanks, Jack. By the way, I haven't seen Dennis around all week. Where is he? Dennis Day? Well, Dennis isn't here. You see, when we went to the railroad station in Detroit, he got mixed up and took the wrong train. Well, where is he now? Well, if the Republicans can't decide on anybody, he may be our next president. <laughs> anyway, we'll... We'll probably... Oh, hello, Phil. Hiya, Jackson. Hello, girls. Hello, Phil. Hello, Phil. Well, two new looks with one old schnook. <laughs> Uh, Phil, don't be so smart. Hey, Jackson, this dressing room you've got here is wonderful. Mine ain't got nothing in it. Well, Phil, if there's anything you need, just take it out of here. Okay. I'll take this. Put that down. That's rubbing alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's no telling what that'll do to your stomach. Well, let's find out. <laughs> Phil. It's too late. The bottle's empty. Well, to each his own. <clears throat> Imagine anybody. Hey, now look, Jack. Phil, turn friend. around. Your breath is scorching my soup. <laughs> you know, Jack, I think Phil ought to watch himself a little bit, especially here in Cleveland. After all, Cleveland is Bob Hope's hometown. Mary's right, Phil. You know, the people in Cleveland think so much of Bob Hope that I'm surprised we even got in here. No kidding, Jackson. Do they really think that much of Hope here? Do they? You know those white lines that run down the middle of the street? Yeah. Pepsodent. <laughs> put it on with a toothbrush yet. Look, Jackson, <laughs> this might be Bob Hope's hometown, but I heard you played here long before Hope even thought of being a comedian. Well, I didn't know that, Jack. When did you play here before? Oh, I don't remember. It was a long time ago. Phil, how long ago was it? I don't know, but when Jack was here, the Cleveland Indians were scalping people in the Carter Hotel with a wigwam. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Wanga, okay. Gee. Hey, look. Look what time it is. Say, Marilyn, you better get ready for the next show. All right, Jack. Say, Marilyn, I noticed during the first show you wore those lovely long false eyelashes, but during the second show you didn't have them on. Well, Jack told me he was the star and made me give them to him. <laughs> oh, for heaven's sake. Jack, come here a minute. Okay. Bend your head down. Like this? Yes. Here, Marilyn. <laughs> Bye. Come on, let's go to your dressing room. Oh, well, I didn't look good in them anyway. Say, Rochester, how's the house out there for the next show? Is it packed? Yeah, very good, boss, very good. That's fine. You know, Rochester, I'm doing everything to try and set a new box office record. I know, boss, but didn't you go a little too far when you made the ushers buy tickets? <laughs> well, if the orchestra boys aren't complaining, why should they? And by the way, uh, how are we... How are we doing on the, on the popcorn? Not so good since you substituted chicken fat for butter. <laughs> yeah, I never thought they'd notice it. Well, Rochester, I'm kind of hungry. Open those sandwiches, and will you please get me a glass of milk? Yes, sir. Phil, what do you have? Bicarbonate of soda. 
Bicarbonate of soda. Yeah, something happened to my stomach when you mentioned milk. <laughs> oh, yes, I'm sorry, Phil. Forgive me. Look, I'm, I'm going in the other room and lie down for a moment. Okay, Phil, but take off your shoes if you're going to. I don't... Now, who can that be? Come in. Pardon me for disturbing you, Mr. Benny, but may I have your autograph? Certainly, certainly. Who shall I make it out to? Uh, Bob Feller. Bob Feller! <laughs> well, Bob Feller, it's certainly a pleasure having you drop in to see me. Well, Jack, when I saw your name in front of the theater, I just couldn't walk right on by like everybody else. <laughs> oh, you mean you, you bought a ticket and saw my stage so? I sure did, Jack. I thought you saw me. Uh, when you took a bow, you know, you knocked a bag of popcorn out of my hand with your eyelashes. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Well, let me wipe the chicken fat off your sleeve. <laughs> <laughs> well, Bob, you're still with the Cleveland Indians, aren't you? Uh, yes, this is my 12th season, Jack. And you're a pitcher, isn't that right? That's what it says in my book. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. You wrote a book, didn't you? How to become a pitcher. I read it. Uh, you know, maybe I should. No. <laughs> Not after that game today. Not after that game today. Oh, well, that's pretty good. You must have brought your own writer, too. Hey, Jackson, how do you expect anybody to get any sleep around oh, here? Oh, Phil, only... come on in. I want you to meet Bob Feller, pitcher for the Cleveland Indians. Oh, hiya, Bob. Hiya, Phil. Say, Phil, uh, you're a pitcher, too, aren't you? Me a pitcher? No, I'm a musician. Didn't you see me leading the band? Oh, is that what you were doing? <laughs> Certainly. Gee, I wish I could do that. Why? And with a wind-up like that, there'd be no one that could hold me. <laughs> <laughs> You're not kidding. And say, Bob, I meant to tell you, I like that nice stadium you have here in Cleveland. Have you seen it, Phil? Yeah, it's a wonderful ballpark, right on the edge of Lake Erie. I saw a game the other day, and... Hey, wait a minute. I just thought of something. The other day when you were playing Boston, you only had eight men. Oh, no, no, we had nine. No, no, I counted everyone on the diamond, and there were only eight. Oh, you could only see eight. When Ted Williams is up, we put the left feeler in a canoe. <laughs> well, that'll teach you to ask questions. Now, don't... Well, Jack, Jack! I'm here, Don. Well, Jack, I've got the quartet with me, and don't you think... Wait a minute, Don. Get... First, I want you to meet Bob Feller. Hello, Don. Well, I'm certainly glad to know you, Bob, and I'm particularly glad you're here because the quartet's going to do a number dedicated to the Cleveland Indians. Say, that'll be swell. And Don... Hey, wait a minute, Don. Why is your coat so wrinkled? Well, uh, I was at the ball game Friday night. It rained, and they used my coat to cover the infield. <laughs> oh, yes, I read about that. One of the ground crew got lost in your pocket. <laughs> they said, why is it every time we... Oh, Jack, Marilyn and I would like to know... Oh, that... come in, girls. I want you to meet Bob Feller. Bob, I want you to meet... Bob. <laughs> Bob, why are you staring at the girls like that? Well, if I had half the curves they've got, I could have beaten Boston. <laughs> Very good, Bob. Very good. Bob, this is Mary Livingston, and this is Marilyn Maxwell. Hello, Hello Bob. Bob. Hello. Uh, say, Mary. Yes, Bob? I feel as though I know you because I met your mother about two years ago. My mother? Really? Uh, yes, yeah, she pitched against me in Plainfield. <laughs> That's funny. I thought she was in the National League. <laughs> You're both wrong. Her arm went bad. She's wrestling now. <laughs> All right. Well, Bob, we'll be going on stage in a few minutes. Why don't you wait until after the next show and we'll all go out to dinner? I'd love to, Jack. Uh, do you mind if I call my wife? Not at all. Which reminds me, Jack, you ought to know my wife. She comes from Waukegan. She does? I didn't know you married a girl from Waukegan. Oh, sure. Her name was Miss Winther. 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 Oh, I not only know her, I used to take her out. Marcella Winther. No, no. That's her mother. <laughs> My wife's name is uh, Virginia. Let me see, her mother. But it can't be. I remember carrying her books to school. She had long blonde curls. Yes, with a little freckle on the right cheek. Yes. Well, that was her father. <laughs> now, cut that out. <laughs> say, Bob, I'd like to ask you a question. Isn't there some guy from radio and movies, some fella that's part owner of the Cleveland Indians? Uh, yes, there is. Well, you know, I, I own the Waukegan Bloomer Girls, and I was just wondering if... How 
How do you do, ladies and gentlemen? This is Bob, back in his hometown of Cleveland to watch the Indians play Hope. <laughs> Telling you all, if you use Pepsi like the baseball players do, you will be keeping Bob, feller. <laughs> he did it today. At least say hello to me or please, something. Please, please. Well, here I am. I saw both games today. What a team here. You know, they don't have big league baseball in Hollywood, and I'll tell you why. It's tough sliding in the second base with a bare midriff. <laughs> wow, this happens to be my Nothing program. Nothing for the tailor, please. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a cinch we'll be cut off the air today. <laughs> oh, but it's great being home again. All my relatives met me at the station yesterday, and I was really touched. I, I have a lot of relatives here in Ohio. I have one brother doing fine in Canton, another doing five at Columbus. Bob, will you wait a minute? Please. For... Who is this? A house detective? Please. <laughs> hey, you know, you might as well quit. You're not getting paid for this, you know. <laughs> Don't ruin our finished gag, will you please? My relatives met me yesterday morning with a big brass band. That is, I thought it was a big brass band. It turned out to be a lot of spittoons going to the Republican convention. <laughs> and it was different when I lived here years ago. This time, the cops drove me from the station. <laughs> of course, the city has changed quite a bit. I can remember a lot of little things about this town. I can't seem to get them on the phone, though. <laughs> I might as well go home. Come I mean. on. What is that? Something left over from the Eagles convention? What is that? <laughs> I went out to my old grammar school yesterday, Fairmont Junior High, and there was the same old desk, the same old inkwell, same old shaving kid. I want to tell you, it was thrilling. <laughs> what memories that brought back? I'll never forget second grade where I met my first girl. She was seven, I was 18. <laughs> and I was so proud. On my desk, they have a plaque that says, Bob Hope slept here. And today I went back and saw the house where I used to live. Boy, what a tough neighborhood. It was so tough the freight trains used to tiptoe past. <laughs> but it was wonderful. I'll never forget when I left home to go on the road, Father said I would go a long way. In fact, he nailed the door of the Bucks box cop. Though, he did. Yes, he did. <laughs> In fact, he nailed, he nailed the door of the box I know, we heard it. We know the joke. We know the joke. Look, That's why you could have come in, you now, know. Now, what are you doing here? I want to know, what are you doing here? I'm getting laughs. What are you doing here? <laughs> I'm trying to. And, hey, Bob, here's one of your boys, Bob Feller. One of our boys. That's an annuity, Jack, this boy. <laughs> Hello, Bob. Hello, Bob. Two Bobs. That'll get you a warm beer in England. <laughs> Thanks for letting me have that one joke. <laughs> I have a line you gave me, which is no good. It says it didn't get you anything here, which you got a lot of. Well, look, Hope, let me ask you something. What, what, what are you really doing here in Cleveland? Well, I came here to watch out for my interest. I found out you were playing here, and this is my hometown, you know. Well, what about it? Well, how much money have you taken in at the Palace Theater already? Well, so far, about $34,000. Well, give me half or I'll sue you. I don't muscle in the Waukegan, you know. What do you tell... I'm playing this whole circuit. Last week in Detroit, I took a $93,267.43. And a Hoover button. <laughs> How do you know? I ain't spending any Dewey buttons to see you. <laughs> you know... You know, Bob, you're cheaper than Fred Allen, and he's almost as cheap as I am. I'm telling you. <laughs> And Crosby's cheaper than all of us. <laughs> I think you got something there. From New York City, the Lucky Strike program starring Jack Benny with Barry Livingston, Phil Harris, Rochester, Dennis Day, and yours truly, Don Wilson. Ladies and gentlemen, 
gentlemen, this is our last broadcast of this season. We've had 39 strenuous weeks of radio, and on the shoulders of the star of our show fell the task of carrying this burden. So, without further ado, we bring you a very tiresome comedian. That's tired. Jack Benny! <laughs> Thank you. Hello again. This is Jack Benny talking. And Don, you're right. This has been a very grueling season. Work, work, nothing but work. I tell you, Don, I'm so tired right now, I can hardly keep my big blue eyes open. <laughs> I'm really all in. Well, Jack, I know it's been a tough season, but I can't understand why you should be that tired. After all, you're only 39. Well, look, Don, it's hard for a man of your age to realize how tired you can get. How old are you? 38. Well... <laughs> Just wait 15 years till you're 39. <laughs> we'll be tired, too. Of course, the burden you're carrying is not on your shoulders. <laughs> I mean, how you got a pair of pants to fit your burden is beyond me. Oh, now, wait a minute, Jack. I wish you'd stop joking about my being fat. It's embarrassing. People on the street point at me. Why, taxi drivers won't even stop for me. See, I can't understand that, Don. New York taxi drivers are known for their courtesy and politeness. Well, I take the fellow who drove me from the station to my hotel. When I got out, he was so shy, he wouldn't even ask me for the fare. He just grabbed me by the ankles, turned me upside down, and shook me. <laughs> Can you imagine that? Oh, my goodness, Jack. What did you say? Nothing. I had my money in my mouth. <laughs> Anyway, I will say this cab driver is very efficient. He picked me up at the station, drove straight to the Sherry Netherlands Hotel. Oh, do you live there? No, he does. <laughs> you know, these cab drivers... Well, look who's here. Hello, Mary. Hi, Jack. Hello, everybody. Well, Mary, here we are finishing another season. Another 39 weeks that you've worked for me. How do you feel? Hungry. <laughs> what do you mean, hungry? On what you pay me, I can't even open a window at the automat. All right, all right, you and your jokes, automat. I saw you at the store club last night. I was selling cigarettes. <laughs> <laughs> selling cigarettes? How'd you do? <laughs> Not bad. I was first again with tobacco men. <laughs> hey, that's pretty good. You know, we can use that routine at the Palladium Theater in London. Just think, Mary, pretty soon we'll be on the high seas... On our way to England. I know, and Jack, before we go, you ought to have all your clothes clean. That chip we're uh, going on is kind of big. You won't be able to lean over the side and do your laundry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm glad you didn't stop too long there. <laughs> I'll find a way. By the Mary, Mary, I tried to reach you yesterday. I tried to reach you yesterday. Where were you? I was visiting my sister, Babe, in the polyclinic hospital. Gee, I didn't know Babe was sick. She's not. She's the janitor there. <laughs> Honey, I knew she could do it. I can't understand how Murph lets her... Come in. Telegram for Jack Benny. Here, boy, I'll take it. Here's a tip for you. Oh, boy, a nickel. Now I can live at the Sherry Netherlands. <laughs> hmm. Jack, who's the telegram from? Wait till I open it, Mary. Mm. Mm. Here, Mary, you open it. I haven't had my Wheaties today. <laughs> okay. What does it say? Uh, dear Jack, understand you're going to England next Wednesday. Wish I had gone last Thursday. Signed, Joe Walcott. <laughs> well, isn't, it? isn't that nice? He wired me as soon as he came to. Wasn't that, nice? that was really all a... right, Jackson. They've waited long enough, so stand aside, Dad. Let them see me. Let them see you. It's pretty. Well, Phil, here we are finishing another season. Another 39 weeks that you worked for me. How do you feel? Thirsty. <laughs> oh, fine. Mary's hungry and you're thirsty. Hey, Jackson, were you at the Lewis Walcott fight at the Yankee Stadium Friday night? Sure, Phil. I was sitting right up front. Did you hear the big reception I got when I came in? Everybody jumped to their feet and cheered and yelled. Really, Phil? When'd you come in? At two minutes and 56 seconds of the 11th round. <laughs> oh, Heaven's sake, Phil. They were cheering the fight. Jersey Joe Walcott was staggering all over the place. So was I. <laughs> what? A 
hope Walcott fell better the next morning than I did. <laughs> I'm sure he did. Say, Phil, I haven't seen you since you came in from Cleveland. Where have you been? Oh, Donzie, I had to stop off in Philadelphia to cast my vote at the Republican convention. You, uh, Phil, you cast your vote? Uh? Certainly. I was chairman of the delegation from Dewa oh! Denny. <laughs> You can't give them those words. Well, why do you keep putting them in there? <laughs> Say, Jack. What? Didn't you think the convention was exciting? The convention, it sure was. Those Republicans must be pretty sure of getting into the White House. They nominated Dewey, Warren, and four piano movers. <laughs> and you know, kids... It's quite an honor to us Californians to have our governor nominated for vice president. I'm pretty thrilled because just two years ago, Earl Warren was a guest on my program. Yeah, and Jackson, that Governor Warren's really a good-looking guy, ain't he? He sure is, Phil. He's very popular, too. Yeah, what a guy. Handsome, beautiful smile, full of charm and personality. Why, if he could lead a band, he'd be another Phil Harris. <laughs> How do you like that? Say, Phil. What is it, Livy? <laughs> If Walcott's head was as big as yours, Lewis would have hit it in the first round. Mary, I could kiss you for that. Thanks, Jack, but I'm still hungry. Well, I'll get you a sandwich when we get to London. No use having one here. We may have a rough voyage. You know. <laughs> I wish you were going to England with me. Hey, Jackson, while we're over in London, I'm going to buy one of them English tweets. You mean a suit? Yeah, and I ain't going to take just any old English suit in London. I'm going to pick a dilly. <laughs> I'll bet Milton Berle's got that written down already. <laughs> written down? He's got it on television right now. <laughs> and not only that, as soon as we oh, get... hello, Mr. Benny. Oh, hello, Dennis. <laughs> well, Dennis, here we are finishing another season. Another 39 weeks you've been working for me. How do you feel? At the Sherry Netherlands. <laughs> What? Gee, I read the wrong line. <laughs> Dennis. Dennis, I haven't seen you since we got to town. You been having a good time? Boy, I'll say. Gee, I really like New York. The people here are so friendly and so trusting. Trusting? What do you mean, kid? Well, last night a fellow stopped me on the street and he wanted to borrow $5. And when I gave it to him, he didn't even ask me my name. <laughs> For heaven's sake, Dennis, if he didn't get your name, how will he know who to return it to? Well, he stuck with the money. Let him worry about it. <laughs> Dennis, kid, come here a minute. Huh? I want to feel your head, see if it's ripe enough to pick yet. Say, <laughs> hey, Dennis, I want to thank you for taking me to the fight Friday night. You were the only one that asked me. Dennis, you take Mary to the fight? Yeah. Gee, what excitement at the end of the 11th round when the police all gathered around, picked him off the floor, and carried him back to his seat. Joe Walcott? No, Phil Harris. <laughs> oh, yes, yes, Phil. Gee, I was so proud. He's my friend. <laughs> Dennis, Dennis, everybody here in the studio is anxious to hear your song. How about it? Okay. Now, hold it, kid. Come in. Well, 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 Mr. Kitzel. Hello, Mr. Benny Boy. <laughs> oh, my, it's a pleasure to see you. Well, Mr. Kitzel, how do you happen to be in New York? I came here last week to go to a wedding. A cousin of mine got married. Oh, well, congratulations. Mr. Sure. Kitzel. Yes. Did you have a good time at the wedding? Ho, ho, ho. It was a big party, eh? Your wine flowed like celery tonic. <laughs> celery tonic? That's a vegetarian champagne. <laughs> oh. And then right after the ceremony was over, I was the first in line to kiss the groom. The groom? You're supposed to kiss the bride. With her face, we had trouble getting the groom to do it. <laughs> Oh, well, did you meet a lot of your old friends there? Everybody who I knew for years, even Pansy Nussbaum. Pansy Nussbaum, huh? Uh, she's working for, uh, you should excuse the expression, I have Fred an Allen. idea. Yeah, I have an idea. <laughs> well, Mr. Kitzel, I'm awfully glad you dropped in. Thank you, Mr. Benny. And here I brought you a farewell present for your boat trip. I had that made especially for you. 
Well, let's see it. Now, isn't that cute? A long bagel that spells out Bon Voyage. <laughs> thank you very much, Mr. Kitzel. You should think good help. Thank Goodbye. you, thank you. Goodbye. <laughs> Isn't that funny how I run into Mr. Kitzel nearly every place I go? Now, come on, Dennis. It's time for your song. What's it going to be? It's a lullaby that I recorded for RCA Victor called Sleep My Child. Swell. Go right ahead. <laughs> that was a really wonderful number, Dennis. You, and you sang it beautifully. And, Phil, it's the first time I've heard the orchestra sound so nice. And I'll take it. It's probably Rochester. Hello? Hello, this is the operator. I have a long-distance call for Jack Benny in New York City. Long distance, where's it from? Harlem. <laughs> That's what I thought. Put him on. Hello? Hello, Mr. Bay, this is Rochester. <laughs> well, it's about time you called, Rochester. I haven't heard from you since we arrived in New York. I'm sorry, boss, but Monday night when I got to Harlem, there was a big party celebrating Joe Lewis's victory. Monday night? Wait a minute, Rochester. It wasn't until Friday night that Lewis beat Walcott. We're still celebrating his victory over smelling. <laughs> but that was ten years ago. Why are they holding the party now? It was postponed on account of rain. <laughs> well, Rochester, I hope it's not a wild party. Uh, what are you having to drink? I don't know, but I'm calling from the chandelier. <laughs> That's what I thought. Now, Rochester, I hope you packed everything in my trunk that I need. You know, while I'm in London, I'm going to participate in the Olympic Games. You are? <laughs> yes, sir. Well, <laughs> surprised. I so hope you win, boss. I hope you win. You do? Yeah, America hasn't had a tiddlywink champion in years. <laughs> Rochester, I'm not going to L London just a tiddly. Look at for your information, I'm going to throw the discus. You're going to what the who? I'm going to throw the discus. Throwing the discus is an ancient Roman sport that was popular during the days of Nero. I thought you were playing the fiddle then. <laughs> now cut that out. Rochester, when I leave, I hope you'll be down to the dock to see me off. Oh, I will, boss. I will. Goodbye, Rochester. Goodbye. I'm going to miss Rochester, too. But just think, kids, in a little while, we'll be out on the Atlantic Ocean. Headed. Come in. Uh, pardon me. I was looking for the washroom, but this will do. <laughs> My friend. <laughs> right out. Uh, Jack, I really uh, dropped in tonight. Wait a minute. Fred, wait a minute. Let me look at you. Yeah. Gee, you're looking swell. Yeah. I've never seen you have such rosy-colored bags under your eyes. <laughs> uh, look, Jack, I dropped in... And that pained expression on your face. You look like a hen trying to lay a basketball. <laughs> I'm getting mine in first. <laughs> well, all right, Jack. Uh, and uh, those wrinkles. Yeah. Honestly, Fred, your face looks like a convertible with the top halfway down. You know what I mean? Now, sit down, little man. <laughs> you must be tired after that Bob Hopian outburst. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please tune in your radios an hour from now when this nature boy of the gay 90s <laughs> is a guest on my program without his writers. <laughs> now, Fred, what... Benny, you... with, without his writers, you can't tell Benny from Mr. Hush. <laughs> Now, wait a minute, Fred. What do and you he should talk about the way I look. Benny's hairline has receded so far, he combs his eyebrows to keep up his morale. <laughs> Fred, no. I have seen more fuzz on a harvest moon. <laughs> I'd hate to be drowning and have someone throw me a line like that. I <laughs> For 
persimmon face. Look yeah. at What did you come barging in here for, anyway? Well, frankly, I didn't uh, drop in here to see you, Jack. It's Mary I'd like to talk to. Hello, Mary. Hello, Fred. What is it you wanted? Well, Mary, you can do me a great favor. I came... Hiya, here... Frederick. Long time no see. Well, if it isn't Phil Harris, Hollywood's answer to, Look, Ma, I'm drinking. <laughs> There's, uh, there's Dennis Day. Hello, Dennis. Hello, Mr. Allen. Look, Fred, we're doing a program. Now, what do you want to see Mary about? Uh, yes, Fred, what is it? Well, Mary, every now and then, Portland likes to take a couple of weeks off my program, and I thought, you know, I thought a hungry girl like you, uh, might, uh, <laughs> might like to take her place. Well, thanks, Fred, but I don't think I could take Portland's place. Oh, yes, you could. Why don't you try, uh, just try reading a line or two? Wait a minute. <laughs> I don't want my program sounding like yours. I had three answers to that, Mr. Benny. <laughs> Two of them the censor took out, and the third one I wouldn't dare tell without an air wick on the premises. <laughs> oh, Jack, I'll just imitate Portland for a second. It won't sound like Fred's program. Well, go ahead, Mary. Well, all right. Oh, Mr. Allen! Mr. Allen! What is it, Portland? I'm from the South, the deep South, that is. <laughs> terrible, terrible, terrible. <coughs> and I'm not wrong for this one. Dennis. Howdy, Bob. <laughs> now, stop that. <laughs> Look, Fred, will you please let me run my own show? This is worse than last week when Bob Hope dropped oh, in. Oh, no, no, not, no, not worse than last week. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> We used up so much time, my program was cut off the air 10 seconds too soon. Well, I thought it was cut off 30 minutes too late. <laughs> now, listen, now. Oh, wait a minute, Jack. Don't get excited. And, Fred, as much as I'd like to substitute for Portland, I couldn't. You see, Jack has me signed to exclusive contracts. Well, Mary, that's nothing to worry about. Contracts can be broken. Let me see yours. Well, Fred, I I'd rather not. I'm too modest. What has modesty got to do with your contract? It's tattooed on my back. <laughs> You're darn right. Anyway, Mary, you're under exclusive contract to me. If you go on Fred's program, I'm not going to take you to Europe. Oh, all right, Jack, I won't. You know, Fred, uh, we're going to appear at the Palladium in London. Yeah? And then we're going to tour the continent. We're even going to Germany. Good. That'll teach him to start wars over there. <laughs> <laughs> that I'm going to ignore entirely, as I hoped the audience would. Oh, Jack, <laughs> arguing. Why don't you two kiss and make up? Well, all right, Mary. I'm willing. Of course you're willing. You have to kiss me. Look what I'm stuck with. <laughs> anyway, I'm leaving for England soon, so I won't have to see you for a while. Well, I can't imagine you spending the money to go to Europe. What are you talking about? I always spend money. Well, I even went to see the Lewis Walcott fight. I know. I saw you coming out of that newsreel theater. <laughs> what? You spend money. Why, the last time you opened your wallet, Washington said to Lincoln... Pull down the shade, Abe. The light's killing me. <laughs> Listen, now, another crack like that, and I'll punch you so hard, it'll straighten out your wrinkles and make your face four feet square. <laughs> I've seen like better that. material than that in a four-dollar suit. <laughs> <I>. <laughs> Why, you refugee from Yours the old is worse books. than mine. Now, just read it. <laughs> Go ahead. Wait till, you, wait till you hear this one. You think mine is a stinker? Listen to this one. Go ahead. Why, you refugee from the old folks' home... You want the rest of it? Yeah. <laughs> if you had enough strength to double up your fish, you'd be too tired to swing it. There, that gives you an idea. That's what you think. You better shut up or I'll pull your lip down and hook it to your belt buckle. Oh, bro. Now, I'm warning you, Alan. You better get out while I, I still got well, control no of my temper. <laughs> now, careful now, Benny. You're liable to blow your top and you paid eight bucks for it. <laughs> It's about time. Throw them out. Mary. Don't bother, Mary. I'm leaving anyway. Go on, beat it. I'm telling you right now, I'm not appearing on your program tonight. Then you won't get paid. What time's rehearsal? Eight o'clock. I'll be there. <laughs> Goodbye, Fred. Goodbye, Jack. Gentlemen, on behalf of my cast, my writers, everybody associated with my program, I want to thank all of you who have been listening to us for nigh on to 16 years. We'll see you again in the fall. I want to thank Alan for lousing up my program, <laughs> and I hope you'll tune into our summer replacement, a new and exciting quiz program called Let's Talk Hollywood. The show will feature George Murphy and Edith Gwynn, and the guests... This is NBC, the, the National Broadcasting Company.